Today's hearing is a hybrid format. Witnesses are in person. Thank you to all seven of you for joining us. And I know yesterday was a, a long, grueling day. Today will be shorter, if, if nothing else. So thank you for, for giving us your time. Members have the option, however, to appear either in person or virtually. There will be good turnout on both sides, and I assume most, most of our colleagues in both parties will be here in person. For too long, everyone called this committee simply Senate banking because it always delivered for Wall Street. We changed that as the Senate Banking and Housing, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee. We put the Main Street economy and the workers who power it at the center of everything we do. Part of that commitment is to hear directly from the biggest banks that hold so much power in this economy. It's our job to hold them accountable to their workers, their customers, and to the American people. Today, we'll continue a tradition we started last year and hear from CEOs of the nation's seven biggest retail banks. After years of consolidation and concentration through banking crises and rubber stamp mergers, your banks dominate the banking industry. Together, you have over 13 trillion, 13,000 billion dollars in assets. That's half the nation's GDP. You have hundreds of millions of customers. You also have the benefit of a federal backup, a safety net, something that your customers do not have. Your decisions affect millions of people's lives, whether they can get their paycheck, how much it will cost to use their hard-earned money, whether they can save for retirement or their children's education, whether they can buy a house or make their rent payment. You profit from those transactions to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. With those profits and with the taxpayer support you get, come a responsibility to serve your customers in the larger economy. I think you know you don't always hold up your end of the bargain. All of your banks have promoted, for example, have promoted Zelle, the payment app that most of you own. You push this on, on customers, but you haven't take, taken responsibility for the fraud that's perpetrated. We all know about Wells Fargo's fake account scandal. We've learned that Wells wasn't alone. In the never-ending quest for short-term profits, it turned out that other banks pressured employees to open false checking accounts and credit card accounts. Customers who trust you to look out for them ended up with unjustified fees, damaged credit reports and accounts they did not want or in many cases did not even know about. It's even worse for brown and black borrowers. Too often they walk into many of your banks not knowing if that check will be cashed or if they'll be able to open an account. When mortgage rates were at record lows, many of you were more likely to deny mortgages to black and brown borrowers, making it even harder for these families to build wealth through home ownership. You focus on loans to wealthy clients with massive st stock portfolios. At least one of you has complained about the paperwork on mortgages or small business loans for Main Street. And when customers try to hold you accountable for cheating them out of their money, you subject far too many of them to forced arbitration. You take away people's choice on how to pursue justice because, as we all know, if there's one thing Wall Street hates, it's real consequences. It isn't just the outright scams and fraud that damage our economy. It's your entire business model with short-term short -term quarterly profits is the holy grail. I've talked with workers in Ohio and across the country in places that so often get passed over for investment. They tell me about the challenges they have with the banking system. They've watched your banks let them down time and time again. It's why so many people don't trust the financial system. They've been burned over and over by second chance accounts, foreclosures, late fees, overdraft fees. They've been turned down for loans. They've seen branches close. They've been scammed out of their money. Yesterday, I spoke to an Ohioan whose accounts were illegally frozen by one of your banks. She had zero access to her funds for a whole week, and the bank intended to take $442 out of her account, leaving her with nothing. So it's not surprising that more and more Americans turn to shady payday lenders or risky crypto apps. They feel like they don't have any other choice when they have bills piling up and need to come up with more money. Over a third, and you've heard this number, over a third of Americans report they would not be able to cover a $400 expense in an emergency. Think of that. If their car breaks down, if they lose their job, if their child needs surgery or something. All of you make tens of millions of dollars a year, 150 to 900 times what your median employee makes. You don't think twice about $400. That's not a luxury that most Americans have. They don't get the same breaks you do. During the pandemic, the Federal Reserve wa waived overdraft fees for you, for banks, yet some of you, yet none of you waived those fees for your customers in 2020. And it's not just your customers 
who have to make tough, tough choices because of decisions that you make. It's also your workers. You spend your billions in profits on exorbitant executive pay and stock buybacks instead of investing in workers and communities and customers. You say you provide your workers with good pay and benefits, but how, but how does it feel as a worker to be pressured to open f fake accounts or to deny services to someone who walks in the door who doesn't look like you, hardly a culture promoting the dignity of work? Don't take it from me. Listen to what bank workers have said from one Wells Fargo worker. We want the customer base to know we're forming a union really for them. We're tired of having our name dragged through the mud at Wells because of things that we're asked, to, we're asked to have more control over, but the company refuses to give us that control. But it's not just Wells Fargo. Another worker said, they keep telling us we no longer have sales goals, goals but we're giving expectations as far as loan volume, new account, new accounts, day one mobile activation, not meeting these expectations will result in disciplinary actions. They added, but the loyalty and responsibility I feel for my customer keeps me fighting every day. Trust us, you say, we're making changes. We don't need government watchdogs. We don't need regulation. But trust, trust goes both ways. With crisis after crisis, with scandal after scandal, the biggest Wall Street banks have lost the trust of the American people. And as super regional banks get bigger and more complex, they're starting to look more and more like Wall Street. I expect all of your banks to build up capital, to use it to invest in communities, not just shareholders, not just your own compensation and we expect you to treat your customers fairly. We expect you to take steps to make bank workers, to make banks, banking work better for your customers and for your workers. Steps like eliminating overdraft and excessive fees, lowering the cost of basic bank accounts, ending forced arbitration, offering affordable home loans to all eligible borrowers in all communities. It means paying your workers, including contractors who feed you, contractors who clean your offices, contractors who keep your banks and offices safe, paying them a living wage. Some of your banks have taken positive steps to eliminate some fees and give consumers more power and choice over their own money. We thank you for that. Some of your banks have made commitments to increase your workers' wages. We thank you for that. That's a good start. These positive steps need to be part of a real commitment for changing how Wall Street does business, not just one-offs. You're among the most powerful people in this country in this economy. Your entire industry and its substantial safety net are supported by American taxpayers. It's past time for the financial industry to be as good to the American people as the country has been to each of you. We'll continue to hold you to the highest standards so that Americans can keep more of their hard-earned money. Thank you, Member Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome back to uh, many of the witnesses. Welcome for the first time to some. Uh, today's hearing presents an opportunity to discuss the role of the nation's largest banks. At the outset, let me acknowledge what should be obvious. Banks are essential for supporting the economy and advancing American competitiveness. Their core fun functions of taking deposits, making loans, processing payments, in several cases, underwriting and making markets and securities, these all help to safeguard savings, provide credit, and enable economic growth. With nearly $13 trillion in combined assets and operations ranging from mortgage banking to small business lending, the banks here today make vital contributions to the nation's prosperity. But where I see a system at the heart of free enterprise, I worry that other policymakers see opportunity for social engineering. There are activist regulators and some of my colleagues who see banks as a tool by which they can advance their social policy. Unfortunately, there's a growing trend among some banks, several of whom are represented here today, of inserting themselves into highly charged social and political issues really unrelated to their businesses. Banks' willingness to help liberal policymakers achieve their goals makes it very difficult to mount a principled defense against such politicization. Some of my colleagues are pressuring banks to use both their balance sheets and their influence to address issues wholly unrelated to banking, such as global warming, gun control, voting rights, even abortion. Several large banks have been too willing to acquiesce to these demands by embracing an ESG agenda that is harmful to America. Nearly every bank at this hearing has pledged to meet a net zero greenhouse gas emission goal by 2050, with several making even more specific commitments. But absent some major technological breakthrough, carrying through on such pledges will eventually lead these banks to artificially restrict, reduce, or even cut off funding for traditional energy projects. Despite statements to the contrary, None of this really has much to do with Bauer's credit quality or so-called transition risk. 
It's because activists have made the traditional energy sector politically disfavored. Now, we're witnessing the folly of such policy right now in Europe, which strangled its own fossil energy sector and now finds itself deeply reliant on Russia for gas. Does anyone really believe that as the U.S. experiences 40-year high inflation, we should exacerbate the problem by reducing oil and natural gas production and increasing energy prices? But that's exactly what will happen if banks follow through with their net zero pledges and ESG agenda as environmental activist groups have urged them to do. And when you combine that with the SEC's proposed climate disclosure rule, these net zero pledges are setting up banks for lawsuits and legal liability. Apparently, some banks may be starting to acknowledge this reality. A report in the FT just this week says some banks are considering leaving the so-called Net Zero Banking Alliance, a UN-sponsored group that intends to name and shame banks that don't meet net zero pledges. In my view, it was a mistake to join this group in the first place, but for the sake of shareholders in the U.S. economy, banks distancing themselves now would be a welcome step. In addition, banks have inserted themselves into contentious social issues and in some cases even made business decisions based on these factors. For example, several banks responded to pressure from Democrats in the wake of the Supreme Court Dobbs decision by very publicly pledging to pay for the costs of their employees to travel to have abortions. Now, this decision is certainly an individual bank's choice, but it does raise a number of questions, including have these same banks also committed to pay the cost for female employees facing unplanned pregnancies to place their children up for adoption? Notably, when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms, which is an actual constitutional right, some banks have gone out of their way to make it harder for law-abiding Americans to exercise this right, from stopping the financing of manufacturers of so-called military-style firearms for civilian use to debanking retailers that sell firearms to customers under 21 years of age, even when such sales are perfectly lawful. I can't help but observe that when banks do choose to weigh in on these highly charged social and political issues, they always seem to come down on the liberal side of the political spectrum. Beyond the examples I've already given, there are others. Banks that have opined on abortion but not on religious liberty. Banks that have expressed support for voting access but are silent on voting security. Banks that have expressed support for DACA but I haven't heard much about border security. So in my view, it's it's bad business to alienate roughly half the country, but your private companies, you're free to opine as you see fit. But it's no wonder that there's been a backlash from policymakers in states like Texas and West Virginia and Florida. If banks don't cease and desist from weighing in on social and cultural issues, don't be shocked if Republicans, once back in power nationally, seek to pressure banks to advance their goals. Now, I would oppose such efforts, just as I oppose similar efforts by liberals. But once the precedent is set, the potential for future abuse is limitless. Throughout this Congress, I've repeatedly warned about the politicization of our financial regulators and our central bank. I've emphasized that addressing political issues requires difficult decisions involving trade-offs, and in a democratic society, those trade-offs must be made by elected representatives who are accountable to the American people. Today, I'm raising similar concerns about the politicization of our nation's banks. Just as regulators and central bankers are not elected by the American people, neither are bank CEOs. So banks are currently at a critical crossroad. Accept the role that some liberals prefer, which is to have your institutions implement social policy on behalf of the state, or embrace your history as drivers and promoters of free enterprise and stay out of highly charged social and political issues. I strongly suggest you choose the latter path, and I suggest that if you don't, you do risk being treated as public utilities by both parties in the future. Uh, thank you, Senator Toomey. Uh, let me introduce the seven witnesses, starting with Mr. Scharf. Uh, Mr. Charles Scharf has been CEO of Wells Fargo since October 2019. Welcome, Mr. Scharf. Brian Moynihan has been CEO of Bank of America since 2010. Mr. Moynihan, welcome. Jamie Dimon has been CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase since 2005. Mr. Dimon, welcome. Uh, Jane Fraser was named CEO of Citigroup in September 2020. Ms. Fraser, welcome. William Rogers was CEO of SunTrust since January 2012, was named CEO of Truist in September 
2021 following the merger of BB&T and, and SunTrust. Welcome, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Uh, Mr. Andy Cesare has had a long sorry has had a long career at U.S. Bank, joining U.S. Bank in 1985, becoming CEO in 2017. Welcome, Mr. Cesare. And William Dem Demchak worked at J.P. Morgan Chase before he, before joining PNC in 22, um, and when he was named 2002, named CEO several years later. Mr. Demchak, welcome. Uh, I would like each, each of you, if I could, if you would, to stand and take an oath. Raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you very much. Mr. Scharf, is Wells Fargo too broken to fix? Don't we have a statement? Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't do the statements yet. I apologize. I... <laughs> Thank you, Jack. I think they know the first question. Yeah, I guess you know the first question. Uh, Mr. Scharf, you're well, you're, you're, you, you, you begin, please. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Since October of 2019, I've had the privilege of leading Wells Fargo. I reflect on my time at the company. I'm incredibly proud of how we used our financial strength during difficult times to support our customers, employees, and communities we serve while we've worked to transform the company at the same time. I believe that our nation benefits from a strong Wells Fargo, and that's never been more true than today. The last time I appeared before this committee, the country was in the middle of a pandemic, and my testimony and many of your questions focused on what banks were doing to support the communities in which we operate. Those were important questions then, and they're equally important today, given the complexities of the high inflationary environment. Since 2020, Wells Fargo has provided billions of dollars in emergency lending to America's small businesses. We donated approximately $420 million in fees from that lending to small business owners who struggled during the pandemic through our Open for Business Fund. These funds are estimated to have reached more than 150,000 business owners nationally and preserve approximately 250,000 jobs. Last year alone, we helped more than half a million homeowners with new low-rate loans to purchase a home or refinance an existing mortgage. And we closed billions of dollars in new commitments for affordable housing. Between 2017 and 2021, we increased average wages for our U.S. hourly employees by nearly 25% and increased investments in our U.S. employee benefits by 20%. And we launched a unique special purpose credit program committing $150 million to help eligible black homeowners lower their interest rates and reduce their monthly payments. In addition, we issued a second sustainability bond in the amount of $2 billion that will finance projects and programs supporting housing affordability, economic opportunity, renewable energy, and clean transportation. Our work is bolstered by our Banking Inclusion Initiative, a 10-year program to help unbanked individuals gain access to affordable, mainstream, digitally-enabled accounts. Though our work is not complete, Wells Fargo approaches issues differently and is a better company than when I arrived. We have driven a tremendous amount of change and established a much stronger foundation for the long term with a clear sense of urgency on building our risk and control infrastructure. We have changed our operating structure, simplified our businesses, and have a new leadership team in place with the necessary skills and experience to transform Wells Fargo. Almost 70% of our company's operating committee is new since I joined. Additionally, well over half of the senior most people in the company, meaning those one level below the operating committee, are new to their roles. We have also meaningfully improved diversity in our senior ranks. Additionally, last week we announced that we'll commission an external third-party racial equity audit. The assessment will focus on elements of Wells Fargo's efforts to serve diverse communities and promote a diverse workforce. Commissioning this work is a critical next step in reinforcing our commitment to racial equity and helping close the wealth gap in this country. Looking forward, I recognize that the country may be facing uncertain economic times for months to come. I can assure you that Wells Fargo is keeping a close eye on consumer spending and credit trends, and that we will continue to be a constructive partner in forging an inclusive recovery. We recognize that COVID-19 has left many people still in need, and the current inflationary environment has added stress. As a company, we will continue to provide support to our customers, employees, and communities we serve over the long term. 
In conclusion, I want to express my sincere gratitude to everyone at Wells Fargo who has continued to serve our customers and each other, as well as our communities through these challenging times. I appreciate their dedication and resiliency as we have worked to make Wells Fargo better. While we still have much work to do, our foundation is stronger, our business is more focused, we are driving cultural change, and the changes we have made to the company are making a positive impact. I'm confident that we have the management team in place to complete the work ahead. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Mr. Moynihan, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and distinguished members of the committee. Good morning to all of you. It's an honor to be here to represent my 210,000 plus teammates at Bank of America and talk to you about how we deliver responsible growth. This is how we run our company. We deliver for our clients, our teammates, our communities, and our shareholders. We are delivering both profits and purpose. That includes being a great place to work, which is a core tenet of responsible growth. We invest heavily in our teammates and their families. This year, we raised our minimum hourly wage to $22 an hour and are on track to, to increase it to $25 an hour by 2025. We also made an across-the-board pay adjustment to all U.S. employees who earn less than $100,000, increasing their wages by 3 to 7 percent based on the years of service. This is above and beyond the business-as-usual pay cycle. For the fifth time this year, we delivered special compensation awards to our teammates worth $1 billion that went to 97% of our employees. We again did not raise medical premiums for teammates who earn under 50,000, the 12th year in a row we've done that. Our global workforce is 50% women and 49% of our teammates are people of color. Our, wealth man our, or excuse me, our management team is 55% diverse, including 32% women. And our board is 53% diverse, including 33% women. We continue to help our clients manage their financial lives. Over the past year alone, our lending to individuals and families grew by 9%. Our loans to small businesses grew by 8%. In our small business line of business, we have $22 billion in outstanding loans today. Our brand and customer scores are in the best sustained shape we've ever seen. We support our clients with $1 trillion in loans, and we hold $1.9 trillion in their deposits, all to help them live their financial lives. 95% of our PPP loans have been paid off or forgiven. We continue to expand our nationwide network of financial centers and invest heavily in our industry-leading and award-winning digital capabilities. Through both, we deliver transparent, easy-to-use products and services that help our customers save, spend, and borrow. As an example, beginning in 2009, we began to take steps to empower our clients to reduce overdraft usage. We first eliminated overdraft fees for clients when using debit cards at the point of sale and have not allowed opt-in for over a dozen years. We also created no overdraft fee accounts and now have four million of those accounts. We have since eliminated fees for non-sufficient funds on our consumer deposit accounts. We reduced overdraft fees from $35 to $10 per occurrence and we moved the ability to overdraft at the ATM. The second quarter call reports by the regulators show our non-sufficient funds and overdraft fees are down 66% from last year's second quarter and they'll continue to fall as the rest of the program was put in during the quarter. Responsible growth also shows where we have an impact in communities where we live and work. In 2021, we continued our long record with $375 million in charitable giving. My teammates reported 1.6 million volunteer hours across our franchise. We continue to be a lender and supporter of small business and entrepreneurs in our communities. We provide more than $2 billion to CDFIs to finance affordable housing, community facilities, and small businesses. We invested in the common equity of dozens of minority depository institutions, and we have over $100 million in deposits for those institutions. We committed $350 million to 100 private equity funds. Those funds are operated by minority and women entrepreneurs, and they provide funding to minority and women-operated uh, companies. 1, 000, nearly 1,000 companies have been invested in by those funds. Responsible growth requires the support clients of every size and every sector to support a just transition to a sustainable future and energy security for the U.S. and around the world. We believe that capitalism remains the best way and the only way to tackle the big challenges facing society and in the tr transition to a secure energy environment. The private sector simply has the funding, the scale, the long-term th thinking to help these toughest issues. In 2021, we had $250 billion in loans and other support to clients in the area of sustainable finance. 
This includes $150 billion focused on clean energy transition. We work with companies in all sectors, oil and gas clients, who are invest in, including oil and gas, gas clients who are investing to help drive clean energy. I joined Senator Kramer in North Dakota to talk about carbon capture, and we're investing in a company we met there. Responsible growth also means for delivering for our shareholders. We delivered strong profitability, returned billions of dollars to our shareholders in dividends and stock repurchase. This is responsible growth. This is capitalism in action. Thank you, and we look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Moynihan. Mr. Diamond, you're recognized. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about J.P. Morgan Chase, the role of America's largest banks as a force for good for the country, its citizens, and the global economy. We live in the greatest country in the world, built on foundational principles of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise, the sanctity of the individual, and the promise of equality and opportunity for all. These core values are the fabric that binds us as Americans, where the best of what we are shines through, especially in times of adversity. This system has created what is still the most prosperous and innovative economy the world has ever seen, one that nurtures vibrant businesses, large and small, and is a welcoming environment for innovation, science, and technology. My enduring faith in the strength of the country remains as strong as ever. The free flow of credit and investments is key to our nation's global competitiveness. Free enterprise is the flywheel of the economy as capital seeks out investments, individuals, and ideas that drive growth and innovation. And free enterprise celebrates and is inseparable from human freedom and innovation, which ultimately are the stimulus for all human progress. The secret sauce of free enterprise is not the free movement of capital, but importantly, the value of knowledge and free people exercising their rights. What this country needs most is free enterprise, extraordinarily competent government and policies, and more civic-minded companies and citizens. The work we do at J.P. Morgan Chase matters in good times, but particularly in tough times. We provide critical financing to nearly every sector, including manufacturing, service, energy, real estate, and transportation. We finance federal, state, local governments for infrastructure projects, and we finance schools, bridges, hospitals, and universities. We have long championed the essential role of banking in a community, its potential for bringing people together, for enable companies and individuals to reach for their dreams, and for being a source of strength in difficult times. We finance America's ambitions with loans for homes, autos, and a gro growing a small business, and provide value pro product and services to more than half of American households. We know there are businesses only as strong as our communities, so we are focused in lifting up traditionally underserved communities by increasing home ownership, expanding affordable rental housing, and growing small business. <clears throat> the last few volatile years have brought stress and disruption to many of the world's, the, many as the world grapples with war in Ukraine, economic volatility and inflation, economic insecurity and climate change, and a pandemic. It has also shown what great companies with the size and scale of J.P. Morgan Chase can do as a source of strength for the economy. Because we have a strong and healthy company, we can consistently serve and finance American households and businesses while building our communities and protecting America and the American economy. As guardians of the financial system, we support our government and national security efforts to combat financial crimes and to carry out complex sanctions. Each year, we practically identify nation state and cyber criminal threats and work closely with the government <clears throat> to help protect critical infrastructure. And we fuel good American jobs. The businesses we finance collectively employ hundreds of millions of Americans. And as a large employer ourselves, we employ people in every state in the country with starting wages that far exceed any government minimum wage, plus full benefits, retirement, job training, and career opportunities. I want to close by thanking the more than 280,000 employees of J.P. Morgan Chase. I want the public to know how proud I am of all of you who work in every state in this country. The work that you do tirelessly for our customers with a singular focus on doing the right thing. You work on behalf of our shareholders, real people in our communities, including teachers, law enforcement, healthcare, workers, and people staying for retirement. <clears throat> Many of you have faced personal challenges through the pandemic, whether it's your own health, or the health of a loved one, or managing your children's education and childcare needs. At the same time, our work has never been more important or more difficult in the last several years. You continue to persevere with the grace and fortitude that makes me extraordinarily proud. 
I've been particularly moved by our essential work of population. The tens of thousands of you continue to come to work during the height of the pandemic to serve our customers when they need to do the most. You have my deep gratitude, and for all J.P. Warren Chase employees who perform your jobs with integrity and excellence every day, you embody the best of American values and make your country proud. Thank you, members of the, community, of, of the committee, for the work you do for our country. I look forward to working with all of you to solve the challenges facing our country and help grow and safeguard the economy. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Ms. Fraser, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee, um, good morning, and thank you very much for the honor of representing Citigroup today. When a similar group convened with this committee last year, we shared how our banks supported the economy during the global pandemic. Today, while the worst of COVID may be behind us, the economic challenges we are facing are no less daunting. The reforms you put in place and the work we've done since the financial crisis to strengthen our bank's financial foundation have enabled us to continue to be a source of stability. Now, while today <clears throat> I am a proud American citizen, <coughs> as someone who grew up in the UK, one moment. <coughs> 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 I can attend. <laughs> one Take moment. Your time. Yes. Take your time. It's fine. <coughs> so, as someone who grew up in the UK, I can attest to the strength and the fact that the banking system in the USA and the capital markets here in the States, they're the envy of the world. Our financial institutions and our financial markets are essential to American competitiveness, both abroad and here in the US. And they're a reason why the US is such a top destination for foreign direct investment. As living expenses for Americans increase and concerns about the economy grow, we remain focused on our role in, as a bank in job and in wealth creation. Through Citi's extensive global network and footprint, we partner with the most iconic American institutions and businesses, as well as the federal government, to help them navigate the global economy. We have been supporting our clients as they build resiliency, they reconfigure supply chains, and they adapt to inflationary pressures. And we help these institutions invest in projects that put them in a position to succeed in the 21st century. And these investments put a lot of people to work here in the States. The private sectors, we, clients we serve, are where millions of Americans proudly earn their living. And those clients rely on vendors and suppliers that in turn employ millions more. And at Citi, we employ 70,000 people here in the US working in cities across the country, such as Sioux Falls, Tucson, and Newark. The work we do with our public sector partners is a prime example of how we put our balance sheet to work to benefit local communities. In 2021 alone, we partnered with state and local governments to catalyze more than $27 billion in infrastructure investment, such as schools, hospitals, and roads. And many of these large projects wouldn't have been possible without a bank of cities scale to back them. We finance more than $5.6 billion in affordable housing projects last year in communities across 32 states, from California to Ohio to New York. And this total made us the number one affordable housing lender in the US for the 12th year in a row. Breaking down barriers to banking is also a top priority for us. In fact, this past summer, we became the, fifth, the first of the largest US banks to completely eliminate overdraft fees and returned item fees for our customers. And earlier this year, we launched a first of its kind diverse financial institutions group to lead our engagement with minority depository institutions and diverse broker dealers and asset managers. This group 
is focused on helping these diverse institutions scale and expand into new markets. And it includes a groundbreaking rotational program that embeds city executives within the MDIs, and that's for up to a year. So bottom line, my city colleagues and I understand and embrace the responsibility that banks play in advancing economic empowerment and mobility. I hope my pride in City's story has come through. But I also want to be clear about recognizing the need to continue improving as we strive to build a safer and sounder bank for the future. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the work that we're doing to support American consumers and businesses. And I look forward to your questions. Thank Th you. Thank you, Ms. Fraser, Mr. Rogers. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee. Good morning, <laughs> I'm Bill Rogers. I'm the Chairman CEO of Truist, and I'm proud to be here today on behalf of our 50,000 teammates. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Truist is a purpose-driven company, and that purpose is to inspire and build better lives and communities. This drives Truist's mission for our teammates, for our clients, and the many in com communities and sh stakeholders that we serve. For our teammates, our mission is to create an inclusive and energizing environment that empowers teammates to learn, grow, and have meaningful careers. Truist minimum starting pay rate of $22 an hour is among the highest in the industry. Our career development programs provide a pathway to professional growth. They include offerings at the Truist Leadership Institute, as well as tuition reimbursement for education that supports career advancement. We also accelerated career development for Truist leaders from diverse backgrounds which has helped us meet our goal of 15% diverse representation in leadership roles a year ahead of our original goal. To help ensure our teammates' financial security extends into retirement, we offer eligible teammates both a defined benefit pension plan and a 401k match at perhaps the highest levels in the industry. For our clients, our mission is to provide distinctive, secure, and successful client experiences through touch and technology. We recently launched Truist One Banking which includes two new deposit accounts with no overdraft fees, as well as other features to accelerate our client's journey towards financial well-being. Today, 87% of our clients interact with us digitally. We're evolving our products and services to help ensure we continue to offer a best-in-class client experience that's intuitive, efficient, and secure. Client security is a truest priority, and my written testimony outlines actions we're taking to protect our clients. We welcome opportunities to work more closely with law enforcement and policymakers at every level to help protect our banking system from organized and sophisticated criminal attacks. Even when most client interactions occur digitally, exceptional client service often requires the personal touch that our truest teammates provide. Personal touch made the difference for many of our clients navigating the PPP process. At the outset of the pandemic and in the middle of our merger, Thousands of teammates work directly with their business clients to meet their fast-changing financial needs. I'm extremely proud and appreciative of the client letters we received, thanking our teammates for helping secure PPP loans that kept their small businesses open and their employees employed. For the many other stakeholders we serve, our mission is to optimize long-term value through safe, sound, and ethical practices. Truist is a Main Street bank. Our teammates serve our clients at more than 2,000 branches in 17 states and Washington, D.C. We're committed to being a good neighbor and contributing back to the communities where we do business. In 2019, we committed to a $60 billion community benefits plan, which included mortgage lending for low and middle income borrowers, commitments to small businesses and community development lending, community development grants, as well as the establishment of 15 new branches in LMI communities. I'm pleased to report through August 22, we estimate that our combined lending, investing, and philanthropic financing activities have already exceeded this commitment and will open 16 new branches in LMI or majority minority communities by the end of this year. In addition, Truist has been a strong supporter of MDIs and CDFIs. In 2020, a $40 million Truist donation helped establish Corner Square, a new nonprofit that provides capital to racially and ethnically diverse small business owners. In 2021, Truist committed $50 million to serve as an anchor investor along with Microsoft on the FDIC's Mission Driven Institution Investment Fund. 
And in June, True has committed an additional $120 million to, th to strengthen and support small businesses with a focus on black, Latine, and women-owned businesses. In conclusion, I wanna thank all of our Truist teammates for the purposeful way that they serve our clients and our communities and each other. They inspire me every day and I'm honored to lead this company. Thank you for this opportunity to share our purpose journey and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Ciceri, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. U.S. Bank is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and holds one of the long longest active banking charters in the United States. We have spent nearly 160 years serving individuals, families, businesses, and communities, and striving to be a responsible and innovative leader in the financial services industry. At U.S. Bank, we operate a simple, straightforward company with four core businesses, consumer and business banking, corporate and commercial banking, payment services, and wealth management and investment services. We have earned a reputation for being well-managed, financially sound, and responsible in our approaches to underwriting and risk, and this is reflected in our high debt ratings. These achievements are possible only because of our 70,000 exceptional team members. We work hard to take care of their needs and invest in their career growth and development. This commitment has been further reflected in our newly expanded lead benefits and our recently announced increase in the entry-level pay. Thanks to our incredible team, we provide exceptional banking experience to our customers. Our retail banking services are accessible when, where, and how our customers prefer, whether virtually or in person in one of our retail branches, which we operate in 26 states. There are a few areas of our retail banking business that I want to highlight today. First, we have pioneered several digital enhancements. In addition to our award-winning mobile app, we created a tool for our bankers to co-browse remotely with their customers on video. This solution helps customers feel heard and understood when they need help making important financial transactions. Second, we made it easier for individual customers and small businesses to access credit. I know policymakers in this committee have been seeking a short-term, low-cost, small-dollar solution for people who have emergency cash needs. Four years ago, we provided a solution for our customers. Our simple loan product allows customers to receive a loan of up to $1,000 in a matter of minutes on our mobile app. We similarly streamline our services for small businesses. We now can process and fund a small business loan in less than 15 minutes. Third, we are working to make home ownership a reality for more Americans across both rural communities and in our country cities. One such initiative we've launched is Access Home, a program designed to increase black home ownership by engaging with community partners. We continue to provide mortgage servicing to local housing finance authorities as we did throughout the pandemic, and we are a leading FHA lender. Our commitment to serving the financial needs of Americans truly includes all Americans. We recognize that being a good corporate citizen goes well beyond providing world-class financial services. In 2021, we developed Access Commitment, a multi-dimensional initiative to work to close the racial wealth gap across communities. Fulfilling these commitments is important to me, and we have made substantial progress. Last year, we provided nearly $200 million in capital to black-owned or led businesses and organizations. We made $305 million in loan commitments to CDFIs, and we have made supplier diversity a priority, and we are spending nearly $500 million annually in that area. Still, we have pledged to do more. In addition to our commitment to close the racial wealth gap, U.S. Bank is also committed to promoting diversity. This commitment starts with me, and I have seen firsthand the benefits of championing diversity at U.S. Bank. Diversity strengthens our businesses, attracts talent, and allows us to better serve our customers. Our efforts in this area have been recognized. Earlier this year, Diversity Inc. named U.S. Bank to its top 50 companies for diversity for the fourth year in a row. In closing, we believe relationships are a key differentiator for our bank. That is why we are taking the best of our person-to-person -person interactions and enhancing them with new digital capabilities to connect our customers with their trusted partners and advisors. Today, as always, our focus is on serving people. Relationships are the center of our business and the core of the communities we serve and that commitment will never change. With that, thank you for your time and for the work you do for our country. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Mr. Demchuk, welcome. Thank you, Chair Brown, uh, Ranking Member Toomey, and the distinguished members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here uh, today on behalf of PNC. Uh, PNC is a Main Street bank. We are not a Wall Street bank. My office is on Fifth Avenue, but Fifth Avenue in Pittsburgh. <laughs> We're essentially in the same business as we've been in for 170 years since we founded the bank. We help customers 
save money, borrow money, and move money. You know, we're a large bank by historical standards, but we're just one-sixth the size of some of the institutions represented on this table. We have limited capital markets, derivative and foreign operations. PNC is not a global, systemically important bank. What we are is a financially strong and resilient bank that's committed to serving our consumers in a fair and transparent way. I am proud that PNC was the first large bank to modify its overdraft uh, practices. Since the rollout of what we call low cash mode, our overdraft fees have dropped by nearly 50% and continue to fall. We've also made it easier to, for consumers to send and receive payments. PNC, along with other owner banks of early warning services, developed and rolled out Zelle, a real-time P2P play, payment platform. Zelle provides consumers with a free and convenient way to send money to individuals and businesses. And despite the headlines, disputes within the Zelle network make up less than 10 basis points of all transactions. This is not true of other unregulated P2P platforms. In one instance, one of those platforms has 13 times, at least in the case of PNC, 13 times the amount of disputes as the Zelle network. Better, however, is not good enough, and scams in particular to continue to grow across our financial ecosystem. Scams are different than fraud, traditional fraud, and that a bad actor gets a consumer to initiate the transaction themselves. These scams are growing daily in the industry. Regulators and legislators need to respond. It's not enough to apportion the blame after the fact. We need to stop fraud and scams before they occur. Secure networks like Zelle, real-time payments, and potentially FedNow allow for direct authentication with a host bank. They also allow members of the network to identify, close, and police against scam accounts. This is not the case with non-bank networks. These networks are not held to the same security standards as banks. When a scam occurs, banks like PNC have zero visibility into where the money went. We have zero visibility to get the money back, and we have zero ability to close that bad account. Banks follow the standards set under Graham Leach Bliley, and we're regularly, if not continually, <laughs> examined for compliance. Non-bank data aggregators are not subject to examination and supervision. Instead, they hold the financial data of tens of millions of U.S. consumers and rely on something called screen scraping to gather and sell that consumer information. Twelve years ago, the CFPB was given authority based on 1033 of Dodd-Frank to end screen scraping, to secure data, and to stop the reselling of con confidential consumer data through the fintech e ecosystem. Essentially, they were, the given a, they were given the authority to stop scams before they occur. This has not happened, and consumers are paying the price. PNC has had a social purpose since the day it was founded. As a service organization, we believe our success is directly tied to the success of our customers and communities. We succeed when our customers and communities thrive and when our employees feel valued and are rewarded for helping fulfill our purpose. Our commitment to our communities is reflected in PNC's outstanding rating under the Community Reinvestment Act, a rating that we have enjoyed since that was enacted 40 years ago. We also succeed by being diverse and inclusive, which starts at the top of the organization. Half of our independent directors and half of my direct reports are women or people of color. I am honored to be here today and represent the 60,000 employees who work every day who work hard every day to serve our customers and deliver for our communities. It's a fairly safe assumption that all of our constituents are as divided on their views of today's challenges as everybody else in our country. Our job as a bank and my job as a leader is not to arbitrate on who is right or wrong, but rather to find common ground and to, lip and to deliver on our promise to serve customers to keep them safe and to provide capital to our great economy so that everyone may prosper. Thank you and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Demchek. Uh, Mr. Scharf, is Wells Fargo too broken to fix? Chairman Brown, I'm very confident that we have made changes which will enable us to uh, put all of our historical problems behind us. As I mentioned in my testimony, we're an entirely different company today we have a new management team. We've changed our processes. Um, the uh, plans that we have in place uh, across all of the identified historical issues are being executed upon. Um, and the team that we have working on this has the experience and the knowledge to get the work done. Oh, thank you. I, uh, 
just seems to a lot of us, CEO after CEO, year after year, scandal after scandal, nothing seems to be, uh, nothing at Wells Fargo seems to improve. Let me um, go down the line. I will ask a series of yes or no questions. You all have a legal and moral responsibility to do right by your workers and your customers and expand access to affordable uh, banking to everyone, yet ordinary Americans still are denied basic access that all of us here take for granted. Ensuring fair access to banking requires your management teams to make it a social, uh, I mean, to make it a central focus. I'm going to ask questions with that in mind, how you can better serve your customers and workers, and please answer yes or no. Uh, starting again with Mr. Scharf, will you eliminate all forced arbitration clauses which take away a consumer's choice on how best to pursue justice with a bank, yes or no? No. Uh, Mr. Moynihan? For bank products, we eliminated many years ago. Uh, Mr. Diamond? No. Ms. Fraser? No. Mr. Rogers? We allow consumers and our new products to opt out of arbitration. Mr. Cesari? No. Mr. We allow consumers to opt out. Okay. Uh, raise your hands if you are committed to fighting against discrimination. Okay. Thank you. I. Uh, Thus, therefore, I think I can count on your support, right, that for the Fair Access to Financial Services Act, which would prohibit banks and other financial institutions from discriminating on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, or sex. The Fair Access to Financial Services Act, Mr. Scharf, will you support it? I don't know the specifics of it, but the things you mentioned, absolutely. Hey, Mr. Moynihan? The principles were already regulated too, but I don't know the specifics of the act. Mr. Diamond? They're exactly the same position. Fraser? Yes, the same position. We don't know the specifics, but we endorse the principles. Mr. Rogers? We endorse the principles you just outlined, uh, but I'm not aware of the specifics of that act. Consistent, Mr. Chairman, we endorse the principles as well, and I do not know the specifics. Mr. The Demchen. same, thank you. Okay, I, I think you all have really good staff, and I would have thought you would know more about a bill like that before you come in front of the committee, but uh, we will follow up. Uh, next question. I'll start from the right, Mr. Scharf, so you don't have to start this time. Uh, Mr. Demchak, is your bank opening on our authorized bank accounts? I'm sorry, could you repeat Is that? your bank auth opening unauthorized bank accounts? No. Okay. Mr. Sari? Chairman Brown, uh, we regret, we and I take full responsibility that we did open up uh, unauthorized bank accounts is going back to 2010. It's unacceptable. It's inconsistent with our principles and procedures as well as our ethics. We identified 342 accounts over that time, and that's uh, against a population of 40 million opened accounts. We took remediation, we took care of the customers, we corrected the credit polls, and we reimbursed any fees. We also made sure that we strengthened our policies and procedures back in 2016, and that plan is what we're consistently going to continue to do on a go-forward basis. And you will no longer open unauthorized accounts, I assume, from that answer? It's not tolerated. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rogers. We don't tolerate the opening of unauthorized accounts, and we have extensive training uh, policies with our teammates. Ms. Fraser? Uh, we do not believe that we have opened any unauthorized accounts. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Diamond? I certainly hope that we don't. We have procedures in place to stop it, and if someone violated those procedures, they probably wouldn't be at the company. Mr. Moynihan? We have procedures to do. There's a massive review, review done of all our banks in the mid-2000 uh, to 2000. 2010 to 2020 decade, and we run those procedures every day. Mr. Scharf? We've made a host of changes from process to control to cultural changes to do everything to ensure that that does not happen. Thank you. Um, starting again with Mr. Demchek, will you commit today to fight fraud in the Zelle platform by giving your customers their money back? Yes or no? We return money today for fraud. Scam is a different issue, and the Zelle network and the owners are working to improve to get all customers' monies back. Mr. Sestari? We also reimburse for fraud and unauthorized transactions and working hard to work with our customers to educate them on scam issues. Understanding to people listening that, with the exception of one of you, you are the owners of Zelle. Mr. Rogers? We reimburse for unauthorized, and we and uh, we'll work together, and we do a lot of education for our clients to help avoid uh, criminal activity. Ms. Fraser? Uh, fraud is obviously a top concern for us. We take it seriously. We re um, reimburse the unauthorized transactions. Mr. Yeah, Diamond? We reimburse unauthorized, and we take a lot of activities to make sure authorized transactions aren't scams. Mr. Moynihan? We 
reimbursed today for unauthorized transactions. And uh, like Mr. Diamond said, we do send out notices and everything to avoid. Uh, Mr. Scharf. We also reimburse for unauthorized transactions. And we as a company, and certainly across uh, EWS, we're all working towards reducing uh, uh, scam and to try and drive it out of the systems. Okay, last question, my remaining 20 seconds or so. Uh, yes or no question, I asked this question last year. Uh, will you remain neutral if your employees try to unionize, Mr. Scharf? We believe that we should have a direct relationship with our employees, no. Mr. Moynihan? We, we will operate within the, for our shareholders, our customers, our employees, within what the law set, allows us to do. Mr. Diamond? No. Ms. Fraser? We will not commit to being neutral. Mr. Rogers? We will not obstruct any activity, but we can't be neutral to the benefits of Truist and what we offer. Mr. Cesare? We will not retaliate. We will continue to expect to be close to our employees, but we will withheld, We will abide by the law. Mr. Demchek in the union town of Pittsburgh? <laughs> um, we, <laughs> that was a little bit of an addendum well, that, to the yeah, I was digging in there. No, we wouldn't obstruct, but of course I'd be in conversations with our customers about it, so yes, we'd be involved. Yeah. And last statement, I will ask you if I had more time about supporting the child tax credit. You've often come in front of us talking about tax reform and the child tax credit meant a lot of money um, for those six months, those payments of two, two million children, the families of 200, two million children in my state alone meant a lot of money in your accounts. And I would ask you, well, not a question now, but to support the, the extension of the child tax credit and what it means. Senator Tuman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Mr. Diamond, um, I suppose you've been dealing with bank regulators for most of your adult life. Do you believe that the U.S. banking regulators have the statutory authority to determine how quickly America transitions to a low-carbon economy? Uh, I, I do not. I don't either. That's your, that's your authority, yes. That's, that's the way I see it. But here, here's one of my concerns, and I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm concerned about enormous power that some of the regulators have, especially the Fed, and power that is exercised in an opaque fashion. And so my question is, I'm not accusing anybody at the Fed of anything, but do they, as a practical matter, have the power that if they wanted to, they could effectively pressure financial institutions into directing capital where they want it? Yeah, so speaking for myself, they are my judge, my jury, and my hangman. They pretty much can do what they want unless constrained by you. Uh, so yeah, if they wanted to come up with ways to do some of those things, they can easily do that. Yeah. So one of the concerns that I have is the interest that some have to use the financial regulators, especially in the climate space. In Europe, of course, the ECB has broader authority than our Fed has, and they are pursuing this very aggressively. I worry that the Fed's decision to join the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system and the ongoing development of these climate risk scenario analysis are a precursor to regulatory edicts or at least pressure to debank energy companies. And that would be exercising a power that they don't legally have. Um, let me move on to the issue of um, some of America's largest money managers. We know that these managers routinely vote the shares that they hold including the shares they hold on behalf of their customers. And they do that including for those shares invested in passive index funds. With $22 trillion in assets and an average of 25% of the votes at S&P 500 company shareholder meetings, a handful of asset managers can have, it seems to me, a huge impact on companies' decisions. Uh, Mr. Rogers, let me ask you. Um, do you agree that the largest asset managers are capable of exercising significant influence over public companies? Uh, ranking member, thank you for that question. And we want to engage with all of our shareholders. We I want to engage that. with them individually, the largest and the smallest shareholder to date. To date. And certainly those who own more shares have more influence. Well, so one of my concerns is that the largest asset managers in the country have joined the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative that explicitly states as its goal a stewardship and engagement strategy with a clear escalation and voting policy that is consistent with our ambition for all assets under management to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. Uh, here's the problem. These large asset managers have enormous sway by virtue of the volume of votes they can cast, even though they don't even 
really own many of those shares. And of course, control, if, it, if, it, if that sway goes to the level of control, then there are significant ramifications, legal and regulatory, especially if that control is exercised over financial institutions. So I have my staff looking into this issue with the intent of producing a report on this later. Uh, Mr. Demchek, um, there are folks, including prominent regulators, who seem to believe that large regional banks, although not as big as GSIBs, are already too big to be resolved in the event of a crisis, and therefore, they just have to be sold to one of the other banks represented at this table. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. Is it true that your bank is required to submit a resolution plan to the Fed and the FDIC every three years? Yes, we've done so for 10 years. Okay. Um, did any of those plans that you submitted contemplate as the sole resolution uh, a government bailout or the wholesale sale to no. one of these other banks? No, it's pretty easy to draw circles around our regions and sell them. Now, the regulators are fully authorized to reject a submitted plan if they thought it was not credible or otherwise deficient. Have the regulators ever rejected your plan? No. So it seems to me that the approval of your plan is at least a tacit admission that there is a credible resolution uh, plan that yes. is, uh, has been articulated. And, and so let me make a final point here. Some, some seem to think that additional regulation and added capital requirements, there's no cost, so why not? Um, it seems to me that there is a cost of adding unnecessary capital requirements on already well-capitalized institutions. Could you share with us your perspective on what's the downside of having unnecessarily high capital requirements? Well, in this instance, it would crowd out other financings that are needed in the market. It's also making it more expensive and difficult for us to lend at a time when our country needs it. Cost of capital went up. Funds are being used for something other than supporting our economy. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Sir Jimmy. Senator Reed from Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank the panel for your excellent testimony. Uh, yesterday, the Federal Reserve announced another three and a quarter percent increase in the interest rate to 3.25 percent. And with these higher interest rates, obviously, the industry has collected uh, hey, estimate. I'm sorry. Can you hear me you're, now? You're on. You're on. You just aren't close enough here. All right. Okay, uh, I will get closer to the. <laughs> All right, let's begin again. Uh, thank you for being here. Interest rates are going up. I'll cut to the chase. Interest rates are going up, uh, but deposit uh, rates, what you pay for your deposits, are rarely stagnant, very, very low. And it raises the question is that making a substantial amount of money on these increased rate interest rates, uh, why? are you not beginning to raise uh, interest rates on deposits? And I'll start with Mr. Sharp and we'll go down. Senator, thank you for the question. Um, we are beginning to raise rates. We have products that have um, a range of alternatives. Um, uh, I think up to uh, a peak of 1.5% um, uh, as of the other day. And as rates continue to rise, we would expect to continue to increase the rates that we pay our customers. Mr. Morning. The rates are already increasing on deposit accounts, and that that will take place uh, as the rate structure settles in. Uh, you can look back in history and see it. And on top of that, remember that for you know, corporates and and affluent clients, they'll go and buy treasuries and other things directs their money's moving outside the system. And so, I think if you spot judge it now, you'll see a low you see a low rate structure. It'll increase over time, and then people forget zero interest checking accounts or zero interest in any rate environment. That, that is what changes the rate calculation that many people cite. Mr. Diamond? Exactly the same as uh, my two colleagues here. Thank you. Ms. Fraser? Yes, we, we have a, a broad range of different uh, deposit products, and uh, we are anticipating continued rise in the deposit rate. Mr. Rogers? We are uh, anticipating that we would have increase in, uh, in our rates on our deposit products. Uh, we have a wide range of products, and we also offer, offer a lot of services other than rate paid to our clients, and we want to make sure that we continue to focus on those as well. Consistent with that answer, Senator, we offer a wide range of rates, and I would expect them to increase in the future. 
And finally, Mr. Jeff. Senator, it's an incredibly competitive market. Um, we've raised rates. Rates will continue to go up uh, in line with what the Fed's doing. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to go back to something that we talked about uh, last year, and that's the legislation that Chairman Brown and I have submitted that would establish a nationwide 36 percent interest rate cap. Uh, our goal is, frankly, to uh, eliminate, if we can, predatory lending. Uh, I think even in this uh, rising interest rate environment, you've been able to make substantial uh, profits uh, without even approaching 36 percent interest rate. So I think the number is a valid one. And as you know, we already have that protection for servicemen and women uh, through the def Defense Department and uh, the efforts we've done with the Military Lending Act. Uh, Last year, when I brought up the issue, uh, there was a consideration that uh, the principle was sound, but you had to look at it. Uh, you've had a year to look at it. So uh, would you be able to operate successfully under a 36 percent interest rate? And as such, would you support this legislation? And I'll begin with uh, Mr. Schrock. Senator, we, we still continue to believe that what you're trying to solve for uh, is something that we should be supportive of. Um, and we would just want to make sure that uh, in whatever legislation was prepared, there was a contemplation of all rate scenarios to ensure that uh, this didn't result in the reduction of credit in any way for the population you're trying to help. Uh, Senator, uh, similar to my colleague, at the end of the day, this is really relevant to the company, our company in terms of rate structure and things. But I, I would always caution to be careful what you wish for. If you do this outside you know, our industry and other places, does it constrain credit? And I think that's a judgment that you all have to make. But in terms of just a simple number, you know, it's not relevant to us. We don't have anything like that. Yeah, Senator, I totally applaud. Oops. I totally applaud the effort to stop payday lenders and you know, someone else is done. Um, and I think is we should try to do things like that. Uh, and I think for in certain products and services, 36% absolutely works. I just want to give you one example. If we modify it, you can make it work. If I was going to give you, because a lot of you want us to do small loans for you know, three months, four months. So a $400 loan for four months, three months, it would cost us $40 just to process the loan. No interest rate. But because the $40 cost goes into the APR, you know, that would come out as 40%. So if we changed it to the marginal cost of processing loan plus 12 percent, we would definitely be willing to do something like that to help customers. Thank you. Yeah. Ma'am? Uh, similarly, um, we don't charge 36 percent um, interest rates and, and completely agree with the principle of uh, the legislation. As my colleague said, the details matter, and we want to make sure that there aren't areas that would inadvertently um, constrain credit, particularly to the more LMI um, uh, borrowers, and as always, very happy to work with your office um, to help achieve the spirit of the legislation. Uh, and Mr. Wright, and my time is expiring rapidly, so I, a very short answer. We would certainly look at the legislation, and I would have same concerns about small dollar lending to make sure that stays within the banking system, and anything that discourages it to leave the banking system, we'd be against. Short-term cash needs are an important priority. Four years ago, working with our regulators, we developed our simple loan product, which offers that fee structure that is well below $50 for the average loan versus $350 for payday lending. Thank you. I don't have anything new to add. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, Senator Scott of South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that's perhaps I'll ask, start with Mr. Diamond, a question on inflation. For the last 17 months, we've seen inflation higher than wage growth, which means that the average person's spending power is going down, not up. The last six months, we've seen inflation over 8%. Fast forwarding another six to 12 months, where are we and why? You know, the economy is facing some very tough things, okay? We have a strong U.S. consumer. They're spending money still 10% over prior, 10% over last year, 35% over prior year. Their checking accounts are in better shape. Their balance sheet's in better shape. Their debt service ratio is actually almost historical lows. Uh, obviously, it's being eroded by inflation. But it's meet, and that's kind of the current. Yep. The future, not that far away, you have QT, rising rates, you know, more inflation, war in Ukraine, which is deteriorating, oil prices, which I still think are kind of precarious, 
And yeah, those things have the potential to put the country and the world into a recession, which will obviously help inflation, but it's not the preferred way to get there. So the, worst out, the worst outcome is stagflation. So concrete inflation is a very important thing to do. So when I look at the credit card balances, they're going up, not down. Uh, the challenges for small businesses finding employees, yeah. worse, not better. Uh, the truth is that in many ways, our economy is looking at some really strong headwinds. Uh, we would hope that the worst is in the, back, in the rearview mirror, but truly, it, it perhaps is in the windshield. And I just wonder, as we think about the stress tests and trying to break this down for the average person at home, listening to a banking hearing, I'm not sure why they would be listening, but just in case they are. <laughs> question I ask myself is, as we have these conversations about capital requirements going up, which means that loans will go down and inflation still is heading in the wrong direction. Finding employees is harder than it was. Having been a small business owner, that formula looks like a first time business owner, minority business owners are gonna have a harder time getting the credit they need to grow and strengthen the economy in their neighborhoods. Am I wrong when you add all that together? I, I think there are capital requirements which are causing us to reduce lending right now to build up capital because of a recent stress test, which I thought was completely unnecessary. But and the stress uh, test, so you're, so you're the, not stress wrong, test yeah. not, the stress test actually proved that we are in a healthier position than we've ever, you all are in a healthier position than you've ever been in. Therefore, increasing the capital requirements that reduces loans might have a unintended perverse consequence for small business owners trying to figure out how to bring more opportunities to their communities. Is that accurate, Ms. Major? Seemed abnormal to me, yeah. Um, yes, that seems a possible outcome. Anyone disagree with that? So, to me it seems like then the solution is if, if our stress test and the challenges that we're, we're the, challenges that we're putting our banks through in order to make sure that they are healthy enough to endure a pandemic or 2008 should suggest if we want more lending for more business startups, then we're, we would be heading, according to Vice Chairman Barr's comments, we, we would be heading in the wrong direction. Thoughts? I love when you guys are silent. It says so much. We, Senator, if I, if I may, um, there's two things that have changed over the last few years. One is the Cecil accounting standard, which causes banks to have to reserve for the life of the loan potential losses. As we go into a slower economic period, which I believe we're going to go into, it's going to cause banks to reserve and pull money off the table at the same time as we're raising capital requirements, which are also which is also going to pull money off the table. So effectively, we're pro-cyclical and the potential downturn that we're going to face here from those two effects. And let me just wrap up my thoughts so that we can go into another colleague with this simple synopsis. Uh, all that we've talked about makes it harder for the average person in our country to grow their confidence in our institutions, number one. Number two, there's probably, a, according to the numbers, about 5.4% or 7 million Americans who are unbanked. The whole concept of financial inclusion gets harder, not easier, in the current environment. And as we go through weathering more storms, those unbanked may not look positively on a system that they don't understand anyways, and that the rates are going up and the loans are going down. I think this is a very frustrating time for Americans who are looking for a chance to achieve the American dream to achieve that dream. I just wonder if we're not doing more harm than good as it relates to the environment that is not consistent with the average person wanting to lean into opportunity in a time that we need more people getting capital off the sidelines and, and, and into the, to the market. Thanks, Senator Scott. Uh, Senator Menendez in New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a 2021 report by the Financial Health Network uh, found that <clears throat> nearly 60% of all overdraft fees in 2020 were paid by low and moderate income households, and about 25% were paid by Latino households specifically. Mr. Moynihan, Mr. Scharf, Mr. Diamond, your banks each charged over a billion dollars in overdraft fees last year. And while each of your banks have recently reduced or modified the fees, your customers, particularly your low income and minority customers, 
are still at risk of incurring an overdraft fee every time they make a payment from one of your banks. So can you commit to us today that before we see you next year, your institutions will fully eliminate overdraft fees? Senator, we have an account that has no overdraft fees available for our customers, and we believe that the customers should have a choice of the way they want to, their services and the way they want to pay for them at the company. Uh, Senator, uh, if you look at the last quarter uh, call report, you'll see that uh, the overdraft fees in our company dropped 66% from last year. Recently, we announced that they'll drop further because during that quarter, we made some of these changes. We don't believe the full elimination of them is actually a good result, but the amount of overdraft fees we'll collect, we've told people, will be down 90%. That is a 12 to 13 year commitment that we've been able to live up to because we're big and because we have the operating costs and because we're allowed to do mergers and put, a, put together a great franchise. It allows us to pass those benefits through the customers. And so I think we eliminating, I think, has attributes which are different than people say, which the rent payment could be rejected but we reduced the cost to $10 uh, on those instances. We also have 4 million people in a no overdraft account, and it opens 25, 30% all the new accounts. So I think you have to look at this. That small requires list. certain standards to have a no overdraft. No, $5 a month. I mean, anybody can open it and has an ID. Yes. The diner. Yeah, we also offer it. We think it's the right thing to do. 23% opt in. So it isn't like everyone wants it, but those who want it, sometimes it's abused. But I want to, there's two sides to this, which are very critical. First of all, I have faith in the American public to make their own choices. Uh, when people use it, remember there are a lot of occasions where if it's not used, okay, they will be charged a higher fee on the other side. That includes parking tickets, rent, mortgages, where you need pharmacies at the, uh, immediately and you get bound. So people want it for those reasons and it reduces, it can often reduce the cost on the other side uh, and stop them from going to payday lenders. So that's why we're trying to navigate this. I do agree with the concept it does get overused, and we try to do things like financial counseling, and on occasion just turn it off for someone because we think they just use it too much. I, I don't. I I have faith in the American people as you do, Mr. Diamond. I don't think that uh, their choices is to end up in overdrafts. Your banks made sixty-four billion dollars uh, collectively last quarter. Sixty-four billion. So it's clear to me that there's no reasonable explanation to continue to charge overdraft fees on working families. Uh, you just had a conversation with my colleague and friend, Senator Scott. One of the reasons so many Americans are still hesitant to enter the formal financial system is this issue. I hope you'll give more consideration to how you deal uh, with this uh, overdraft issue. I think it inured to everybody's uh, benefit. I've heard story after story from New Jersey constituents who have fallen victim to scans and fraud on Zelle and in many instances, the banks have denied their customers relief. That's why in July, I led a letter to with some of my colleagues to seven of the banks that created and jointly owned Zelle, which includes most of you. I found several of your responses really inadequate. In particular, the responses from J.P. Morgan Chase and PNC did not address the fundamental questions we asked regarding the number of frauds and scams reported by your customers, as well as information regarding refunds and referrals to law enforcement. So Mr. Diamond and Mr. Demchek, will you commit to making the information we asked uh, available to me and my staff as your other colleagues have? Absolutely, and I'm sorry we didn't meet it the first time. And Yes, I, the, the same. I'm sorry we didn't send it in the first I, instance. I appreciate it because that information helps us as we're trying to figure out that consumers are slipping through the uh, cracks of Regulation E, and detail, detail information will help us figure out uh, what we do with it. Uh, finally, uh, uh, Mr. Scharf, in, in March, Bloomberg reported that Wells Fargo disproportionately rejected refinancing applications from African American and Hispanic homeowners. You and I had an opportunity to appreciate your visit. Uh, one of the things that you told me in response to my questions was this was partially due to the fact that Wells encourages more minority borrowers to go through the full applica application process, while some of your competitors uh, turn them away at an earlier stage. Is that is that correct? Uh, we just one clarification is we encourage all borrowers, not just minority borrowers. Okay, but but that would include the whole universe of minority borrowers. Therefore, uh, it, why don't the rest of you do the same? 
encourage encourage them to go through the full application process? Okay, the, sil just, the, sil just, the silence is gone. No, to, so. to be fair, I just don't know if we, we do or don't, but but I'll, you know, we will look well, at that. Would you, would you respond to us for the record, please? Because, yes. you know, yeah. look, the Latino community is $2 trillion domestic marketplace impact already. It will grow exponentially, but it needs to be treated fairly in the yeah. process. Uh, and Ms. Fraser, it's good to see you because this is about the only diversity we have in this industry. Thank you. Thanks, Sir Menendez. Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are uh, all American companies. Okay. And I'm very proud of that. And I thank you for that, and I congratulate you on your success. It seems to me that, that your institutions are a lot like America. You are not perfect, but you are good. Um, capitalism works. Uh, that's why America has the strongest economy in all of human history. Um, Capitalism has done more to lift people out of poverty than all the social programs put together. The poverty rate in our country is 3%. Now, the Census Bureau would tell you it's 12%. But the Census Bureau only ca uh, counts cash payments, not in-kind payments. The Census Bureau doesn't count Medicaid. It doesn't count food stamps. It doesn't count the earned income tax credit. If you count all of those, all of those programs, our poverty rate is 3%. And uh, that money didn't just to, to help our neighbors who are less fortunate than we are, did not come from leprechauns. It came from the American people and their generosity, and they have that money because of capitalism. Number two, I'm not going to ask you to comment on this. Senator Toomey touched on it. You will never win, never, the uber-woke sweepstakes. I understand that the pressure to run that race is fierce. You will never win it. Nothing you do will ever be enough. The uber-woke uh, people in positions of power in this town uh, think America was evil when it was founded, and it's even more evil today. You're not going to convince them otherwise. Um, I believe that um, you're not free if you can't say what you think. I encourage you to do that. I believe that you're not free if you can't... I believe if, that you're not free if you can't express yourself. You have your opinion. Be candid. Don't try to, to win the Uber woke sweepstakes. Number three. I don't like to brag about the expensive places I've been, but night before last, I went to the grocery store. <laughs> Inflation is gutting the American people like a fish. Now, we know what our Federal Reserve is doing on the monetary side. I want to ask you what you think we should do, we meaning the federal government, uh, on the fiscal side. And I want to start, if you could just give me direct answers, because I only have about a minute and a quarter, though I might ask for a little extra time with the indulgence of the, of the chairman. Um, Ms. F Ms. Fraser, tell me what, what you think we should do on the fiscal side to help curtail inflation. Um, there is a, a considerable amount of uh, savings still in the system. Um, we 
don't believe that we need uh, more uh, additional stimulus being put through into the economy, um, that, and therefore making sure that we're supporting those that are suffering um, from the high prices and from what's likely to be uh, a very challenging year ahead, um, that that support is directed to them. Mr. Diamond. Uh, yeah, I think a little less fiscal spending would be good because we had 30% of GDP spent over a two-year period, which is literally unprecedented. Uh, but I also think in the supply side, taxation, immigration, regulation, health care, infrastructure, this permitting bill, if you did some of those things, you will help grow the economy to reduce inflation. Would a tax cut be out of the question for you? I, I think I, I say calibrate taxes so that you create more growth. How about uh, get a little government off the backs of the American people in terms of regulation? That would be helpful, I think, particularly for small business. I don't want to sit here and complain about big companies, but I urge everyone to take 10 small businesses out to lunch and ask them what it's like to live through federal, state, and local regulations, even if they have one store. And that could help a lot. I'm sorry we don't have more time. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Tester of Montana is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always good following Senator Kennedy. It's always a pleasure. You're right, capitalism works if there's competition. And in the meat industry right now, there isn't any competition. And the reason you got hooked going to the grocery store is because those packers are making bank, no pun intended. And so I look forward to your I'm with you, Senator. We both oh. love meat. All right, right on, baby. <laughs> Right on. Uh, my special investigator built in to uh, enforce the Packers and Stockyards Act, but I'm here to talk to you guys and, and, and ma'am. And I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for your testimony. I come from a very rural area in a very rural state. And uh, as you guys know better than anybody, access to capital is critically important if you're going to have business expansion and employment and economy, economic growth. Um, it was a few years ago. In my small town of 600, uh, the bank, one of your banks actually, decided to pull out. Uh, fortunately, we had a community bank come in. They're doing a great job. But that potential pullout and that access to that brick-and-mortar facility uh, could have really raised heck with my little small town where post offices are still important and schools are still important and banks are still important. So this question is for all of you. Um, are you guys committed to brick and mortar facilities in rural America? And if you're not, why not? Uh, we can start with, with you, Mr. Sheriff. Senator, thank you. Um, I think you know this. Uh, we are, uh, I think, the biggest uh, of the banks here um, in terms of our presence in rural America. We very much are committed to continuing that. Um, to the extent that we have exited a location, We've uh, tried to be very, very conscious of ensuring that we're not leaving uh, the town unbanked, um, whether that be through having another bank there or working with another bank to take over our facility. Um, but we do view our, uh, 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 the fact that we are so big uh, in rural America as something that is important and we need to make sure we continue. Yeah, go ahead, just go right down the line. Mr. Monahan. We, our branches are in the market, the 90 odd markets we serve, plus the extent of beyond that 150, 200 markets, and we'll continue to be there. Uh, I would tell you that back early uh, 2011 or 12, when we sold, we sold a bunch of our branches to smaller community banks to make them stronger. 400 yeah. branches in the, in the rural areas we served. We weren't in your state, but in other states, uh, with that exact idea in mind, which is the state, the town or city needed banking. If you get, if you get sold the deposits, uh, to another community bank would be helpful. Okay. Mr. Dunn. Yeah, I'm so proud that we're now in all 48 states. We've opened branches in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, North Carolina, South Carolina, Montana, Billings, Bozeman. I think we're doing an Ennis, and we'll take a look at your little town. Okay. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, we're a bank that has a smaller retail footprint in the States. We have a, a larger a focus on corporate clients and on the retail clients. Um, I would certainly commit that we will be doing our best to support uh, the Montana enterprises. We've long been committed to rural markets. I believe our bank as a percent of branches has the most in rural markets. Uh, but in addition to rural markets, also important, they're also digital deserts. So we're also committed to focusing on areas such as broadband to make sure that we can serve those markets, yeah. not only physically, but equally digitally. Yeah. 
Secretary. Sen Senator, as you know, we are a large player in rural markets, North South Dakota, as well as Montana, and most cities in Montana. We also have large operation centers in some of those rural markets to provide jobs. Okay. Dem Jack. We've grown our presence in rural markets over the last several years, and we've augmented that with a fleet of mobile branches that can cover multiple small towns in the same day. Okay. Uh, I've got limited time, and this is a more complex question, but you guys all know the threats of cyber out there. Um, you know that you're probably being attacked as we speak right now by a, a, a cyber attack of some sort. Um, we need to continue to adapt and uh, work to combat these uh, evil threats. And so I'm just going to pick Mr. Rogers and Mr. Diamond. How, how do your companies ensure that you're devoting adequate resources to, to cyber threats? One of the reasons, uh, Senator, we merged was to create more capacity to protect our clients uh, against uh, and our company against cyber threats. So we do a variety of things. One of the things we do is we bring in third parties to help us. We bring in third parties to uh, look at our systems, to attack our systems, to do horizontal reviews about where we are relative to, uh, to others to make sure that our defenses are the strongest they can be uh, to secure our clients' uh, clients' data. And then we also participate in all the efforts that our regulatory bodies uh, undertake as it relates to cybersecurity. Yeah. Mr. Yeah, we spend several million dollars a year. Everything we do goes through cyber reviews and cyber checks. We do oversight on third parties. Every time you access our systems, it's running through multiple cyber type of things. We work with, we work with the federal government, we work with governments in Europe. Uh, it's, a, it's a nonstop battle. My board reviews it. We'll do anything we can. I put this way up there right behind competition with China. Uh, this, and this war in Ukraine, cyber risk are extraordinary. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Tester, uh, Senator Lummis of Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. There's a bit of a flogging element to what's happening today, but there's also an opportunity for us to uh, learn from each other. So I hope that you'll provide that uh, when I... Uh, ask questions of you. And I want to thank Senator Kennedy for pointing out that, you know, America is uh, the leader in world financial services. Uh, but that said, it's a privilege. And there are other countries that are working at a transformative pace in innovation. So uh, the having uh, China come up uh, at the conclusion of uh, Mr. Tester's conversations with you. I want to start uh, with that issue. Mr. Diamond, um, I want to ask you about a comment you made last month. You said, China looks at America and they say, you have been incompetent and lazy. And then you said, there's some truth to that. Um, so I too am concerned that too many in the financial services industry have been lazy. And they don't see the transformative pace at which the rest of the world is innovating. Uh, payments technology, for example, is far too slow and costly. So your bank is currently testing JPM coin. It's a type of stable coin for faster settlement. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, our duty to responsibly innovate to stay a world leader? Same question to Mr. Cesare. Yeah. I mean, America already is the world innovator and world leader, and China is a serious competitive strategic issue we all have to deal with. And so I totally agree with that. I don't think Americans should be embarrassed. I mean, we still have the most prosperous nation on the planet, all of the food, water, and energy we need, free enterprise, the gifts of God, the gifts of our founding fathers. They have autocracy, not enough food, water, and energy. They need 15 million barrels of oil a day. They get four from themselves or their immediate neighbors, stuff like that. We're in very good shape. The, the lazy part, I'm talking about as policy, is things we got wrong, what we could have done better. Immigration, taxation, regulation, health care, litigation, all these things. I think it slowed down America. And I think we should all be focusing more, how can we grow more and create more uh, wealthier, afford more military, et cetera, et cetera. And innovation in cryptocurrency, they are they're probably ahead in a couple of areas. And I think we should recognize that and combat that. And uh, I'm not really worried about it as long as we get our act together. Mr. Cesar? I agree. I think one particular area of innovation that's critically important is money movement and payments activity. And I think the banks are working together with uh, each other as well as our regulators on activities like real-time payments, Zelle, 
even exactly. Fed now. All those things, I think, will put position as well for future payments activity. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on this? I think, well, I think our colleagues spoke to it, but it, the real-time payment system, uh, the ability to get a 24 by 7 wire system at the Fed would be critical to it, and their new real-time system ought to provide that. But one of the disadvantages in payment system technology is the ability to pay on the weekends and move a substantial amount of money that actually clears. T plus zero security settlement would be doable if you actually could have the money move during the night. And so I think you know, we're all aware of that we've connected our real-time payment system or connecting it to other parts of the world that we've put together through the clearinghouse. That on the enable money to move real time. You connect that with Zelle and things, you can move it with no cost to another banking client. As long as someone doesn't step in and say, oh, that is not sufficient to have Santander in Spain, you do the KYC so we can rely on it. We, we need some enabling things. And I think you know, if we do that right, we can take, you, know, you will see the innovation this is already set up and already moving. And by the way, we move trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars a day very efficiently. Um, you know, so I think people's view of what's inefficient is kind of interesting, but you, you have to look at what really moves. Well, we're aware that money was transferred in uh, cryptocurrency as donations to Ukraine. They were spending it the next day. And if it had been transferred in U.S. dollars, it would have taken about 10 days uh, for it to reach. Uh, I, I see some of you shaking your heads. Disagree, Mr. Diamond? Right now, we're moving $10 trillion around the world. Zipping and zapping through AML systems, OFAC systems, regulations, AI systems, cyber systems, safely, immediately, a lot of it's real time. You're talking about retail payments. Yes, I am. Yes, and I agree with that. That's a thing that we all can work on and fix. But that's a very small thing relative to the other. Thank you for being here. I yield back. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Warner from Virginia is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see all of you. I'm reflecting back on the fact that I first got here in the middle of the um, meltdown in 2009. And I think Mr. Diamond and Mr. Monaghan were on the panel. Everybody else has changed. So maybe your turnover rate is even higher than the turnover rate uh, on the panel up on this side. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure whether that is, uh, I'm not sure what it says about Brian and Jamie. But uh, um, first question I want to get to, CDFIs, MDIs, something I've talked to you all about over the years. Clearly during COVID, we saw as effective as some of our programs were, minority, low-income businesses got left out. Very proud of the fact that we worked in a bipartisan way and with a lot of members on this committee, I want to sh shout out to Mike Crapo, where we got $12 billion to CDFIs and MDIs, $3 billion in loan, and just on the line yesterday with the Vice President, about $9 billion in, in Tier 1 capital. Um, my concern, though, is we got to do more. There is a public-private initiative that some of you are participating in, Economic Opportunity Council, to try to shore up access to capital issues for LMI uh, borrowers. So I'm going to start as one of the new guys on the, the panel, Mr. Rogers, uh, you, and what can we do, what can you all do as the largest institutions in the country to help shore up CDFIs, MDIs? Clearly, the, the Community Reinvestment Act reforms, uh, I thought I've got some ideas about nudging you to get some CRA credit to help CDFIs and MDIs, but I'd like you to speak to that, that issue. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you for your focus on CDFIs, and I think the private and public uh, cooperation has put a lot of capital into CDFIs, and I think that's actually great for the, great for the country uh, and great for the expansion of our economy. And spending a lot of time with CDFIs and spending a lot of time with the recipients of the CDFIs, I think they're now starting to prioritize revenue versus capital is how can you help us get business? So I think the areas where we can support CDFIs more are the areas that we do in things like supplier diversity. Let's make sure that we're including more people in the diversity. Let's, let's make sure that they're getting revenue to go along with that capital so they can use that capital and deploy it efficiently. I think we can play an important role there. So I got a second question. Anybody else want to lean in on this? Because um, I'm going to be back to you with specific requests uh, in this space. I'm going to I'm going to save for Mr. Diamond and Ms. Fraser. I got a second, the next question. But anybody else want to weigh in here on CDFIs, MDIs? I, I, I think right just, Senator, just generally, yeah, this group of banks has done a lot with the CDFIs and MDIs. Sometimes a little different flavor of ice cream, but we all have major deposits with them. A lot of us put equity into them. Some put preferred stock into them. 
but there's cooperating agreements, uh, ATM access, uh, et cetera, that allows them to have access to our, our scale in different ways. And beyond that, we just did an innovative program. We gave them a certain amount of money just to go to community medical centers, to extend medical centers. So I think we're all getting very creative and asking them what they need from us. And I think you've seen the well, I do think we need some additional help I, in I terms think, of back office operations. Yeah, but I think there's, there's elements like that. Let me get to my next question. I mean, I mentioned the fact that my first time up here with you guys was in the, the midst of the financial crisis in 2009. You know, we'd seen an overheated real estate market. We'd seen a series of things where there was, um, um, that had kind of gone unobserved. Yet we're now, I, I fear at times, we've got a whole section of the non-bank, non-regulated financial market. And this will sound like a little bit of a layup to y'all. But, you know, the percentage of mortgages being originated on a non-bank basis. So, you know, we're talking about a number of consumer products. Um, I think some of the old ideas around OCC charters or CFPB charters, I think they may need a, a new look. And I know this is, and I'll start with Ms. Frazier and Mr. Diamond. Um, and I'm, I'll be anxious to hear, Mr. Diamond, your comments because you're against, you made these kinds of comments against regulation. So you think it's a good idea that this whole non-bank sector competes with you guys with no regulatory oversight at all? No, I'm not. I've never been against regulations. I think we need proper and properly calibrated regulations. You can always imp improve and enhance. You know, sometimes they go too far, and sometimes it wasn't enough. That's totally true, and I've given credit to parts of Dodd-Frank. You know, Lehman Brothers wouldn't happen again. So, uh, uh, but if you look at some of these things, and honest, this is an honest assessment, not a complaint. There are a lot of these folks that don't have social requirements, FDIC requirements, transparency requirements. They don't have... Uh, 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 regulatory type requirements, AML requirements, BSA requirements, same kind of cyber requirements. Th that's, that's your decision. We'll, we'll deal with whatever you all and the regulators decide. And so it has driven a lot of stuff outside of banking, which is fine. We can deal with it. I'm not sure it's the right policy for the United States, uh, particularly, Frazier, particularly on mortgages. Although I'd also quickly say, you know, and I think some of us, even on my side of the aisle, need to maybe revisit this in terms of you know, concerns about watered-down charters versus no regulatory oversight at all, uh, I think we gotta figure out how we pick our poison here. Ms. Frazier? The, the balance is very important. The, the US financial system is one of the, the great assets of the country. It is the envy of the world, um, and strong financial institutions is important. Part of that is a rigorous and, and fair and effective regulatory structure and framework, um, and one in which the same activity has the same regulation as opposed to the entity being regulated, I think the strength of the system here in the States should be around the same activity, having the same regulation. I do think we're gonna need, particularly Mr. Chairman, on some of these innovative new financial products, as most customers don't care whether it's a bank or another entity, but we're gonna need some consumer protections. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tils is next. Oh, Kramer's next, right? Uh, it's Senator Kramer from North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Senator Warner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Toomey, and all of our uh, panelists. First of all, I want to apologize for Senator Scott's implication that this isn't interesting to all Americans, I think it's a pay-per-view event. It's been very good, <laughs> particularly when Senator Kennedy started asking questions. Um, that said, I also want to thank you all, and, and, and by the way, all of your colleagues at every level of banking for delivering so well during the pandemic. We were building an airplane while flying it, and I think that you, you, you all did very well in delivering the services and, and, the, and the products at a time when America desperately needed it. And frankly, I think it built the foundation that's, that's saving us today. So thank, thank you for that. Um, but I also uh, want to join Senator Kennedy in this admonition. Please resist the impulse to respond to the very loud noise in your left ears. I'm happy to be the loud noise in your right ear. When it comes to, um, you know, to being one of the cool crowd, I, I, I know the pressure that you feel, and, and I'm sorry that sometimes those of us on the conservative side aren't, aren't as activist oriented, but, but I want to help you. But, I, and this hasn't come up, so I'm going to bring it up. Uh, last evening, I led a letter to, uh, that was signed by nearly all of the Republicans on this, on this dais, to the Bank Policy Institute, and you're all, of course, members, um, regarding this new merchant category code that was uh, that's for gun and, and ammunition stores. And, and I want to be clear about who did this. You know, there's, the, the credit card companies are taking a lot of heat. 
but it's the ISO that did it. It is the International Organization for Standardization, and they did it against the wishes of the credit card companies who opposed it in the beginning. They voted against it on, on, on the uh, advisory committee. They, their, their opposition was upheld, um, and, and then ISO did it anyway. And they did it at the urging of a very liberal activist bank, amalgamated, uh, amalgamated bank. And so I want to ask each of you, as, as the carriers, as the you know, acquirers, as the facilitators um, that are providing the, the, the capital, will you commit to me? Can you commit in front of this committee and the pay-per-view audience that's listening and watching <laughs> that your bank will process all transactions for the purchase of legal goods and services, and I might add constitutionally protected goods? We'll start with you, Mr. Scharf. Senator, we're, we're going to implement the rule that has to be implemented as a member of the network, and we're going to continue to process transactions uh, as we do today. I agree uh, with my colleagues' comments. It won't change anything we do. No, I, I totally agree, and we don't. You know, we cannot be involved in telling the American citizens how their money will be used. That's not our job. Similarly, Senator, we do not intend to use the code to limit or restrict. Um, the purchase of firearms by our customer base. Senator, we, we don't intend to have any restrictions. Agree with comments. We'll abide by the rule, but no restrictions. We will not have restrictions. Thank you all. Good answers from all of you. I, I do want to uh, come back to you, Ms. Frazier, just a little bit, because Citibank has, in particular, um, given me some pause when your bank is voluntarily committed to restrict lending to firearm retail clients unless they meet your specific criteria, which in many cases exceeds the law. And um, I want just extra assurances that, that, that uh, law-abiding gun purchasers across the country will not be discriminated against using this merchant category code as a, as a, a means to an end. Um, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, we respect the Second Amendment. Um, as, I, as I said, we do not intend to use the code to restrict um, or limit any, any purchases of firearm sales by our credit card customers. We do not do so today. Um, we do believe in best practices, best practices for the sale of, uh, the retail sale of firearms. Um, and uh, they, you know, that is the policy that we've had for a while now. Um, most, most retailers follow those best practices. I would say most gun owners do as well. The vast majority of them are yeah. very good people. Indeed. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to wrap up by just inviting you all to um, follow in the footsteps of Mr. Moynihan. Come to North Dakota. I want to show you real progress in, in transitioning to, the, to a, a, a cleaner energy economy that utilizes not regulation, but rather innovation and the great riches that God has, has given us below, on top, and above the earth. And with that, I thank you and yield. Thanks, Senator Kramer. Senator Warren of Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So six of the seven banks who are here today, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Truist, U.S. Bank, and PNC, jointly created and own the nation's most popular peer-to-peer -peer payment platform, Zelle. The banks market Zelle as, quote, fast, safe, and an easy way to spend money, end quote. That is only partly true. Uh, it is definitely fast. Zelle is fast. Zelle is easy. And they increase bank profit margins, but Zelle is not safe. Last year alone, Zelle users were defrauded out of about half a billion dollars that we know of. Now, you built the system. You profit from every transaction on the system. And you tell people that it is safe. But when someone is defrauded, you claim that's the customer's problem. We do oversight on the banking committee, so I want to know exactly how big this problem is. In July, other senators and I wrote to ask you how many fraudulent Zelle transactions your customers have reported since 2018. Only Mr. Rogers of Truist provided the data. 52,000 claims of fraud, totaling $46 million. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, for being transparent. 
but the rest of you stonewalled. So today I get to ask you in person, do I have any volunteers who want to go first uh, and share the numbers that I asked for in July, or will I just pick volunteers? Okay, Mr. Diamond, you represent the largest bank here today, so let me start with you. You didn't provide any of the information that we requested in our letter, none of it. So what I want to know is, is that because you don't keep track when your customers report fraudulent Zelle transactions, or is it because you do keep track and you know exactly how many fraudulent transactions have been reported and you want to keep that report a secret? I, I deeply apologize that we didn't give you the numbers you asked for. I'm sure we responded. <laughs> uh, and we pay anything that's unauthorized, we do cover. So you're really talking about authorized well, transactions that we have an enormous amount of systems to stop, and the amount of fraud relatively is very small for this free of charge yeah, I, service. I very yeah. much appreciate that you're gonna give the commercial for Zelle, but if I don't have the numbers, I don't have any way to verify that. You're gonna get them immediately, okay? You wanna give me a ballpark right now? I don't have the number in front of me. It, do you know the, generally? This is a serious problem that's been going on in this bank. I, I will get you the number immediately. I, I, don't, I don't want to make it up. Well, I don't want you to make it up either, but I don't want you to wait another two and a half months before I get to see. You'll it's get, very simple I data. promise you by the end of the day today, you'll get it. Terrific. All right. We'll get it by the end of the day once nobody's here to talk about it. Um, how about you, Mr. Scharf? Do you have numbers? Uh, I don't hear. I apologize for not getting it to you, but we'll get it to you immediately. Does anybody here have numbers? Uh, yes, <laughs> Mr. Ciceri, good. First, I, I apologize that we didn't get you the numbers. We uh, transact about $1.1 billion a month, 3 million transactions, 0.07% have fraud involved. Okay, not it. I'm sorry, but that's not the number I asked for. The number I asked for is how many customer fraud claims have you received? Mr. Diamond wanted to say, well, we the bank are going to determine what we think is a fraud claim that we think should be reimbursed. What I need to see is I need to see the number coming in on the front end. And that is how many customers held up their hand, called the bank, and said, I have a fraud complaint with Zelle. It's not hard. I presume you guys collect this information. We do. What's your number? 0 0.07 on fraud, 0 0.05 on no. customers raising their hands. How many, I'm sorry, I just need a real number. How many customer complaints have you received of fraud on the Zelle system since 2018? I don't have that number in front of me, but I will get it to you by the end of the day. Anybody else? Mr. Jim Tack? I know the percentages. What, six basis points of scams and fraud. Fraud is As much less. As you define it, right? The total I, disputes are six basis points. You know, what troubles me here is the one person who gave us numbers, the numbers are pretty alarming. And the overall numbers are enormous. We know of at least a half a billion dollars in transactions. May not seem like a lot of money to you, but to the person who just lost $450, it's a lot of money to them. So let me ask this the other way around. This would not be the same kind of problem if the bank stood behind the product. After all, you're the ones who invented it, you're the ones who made it work, you're the ones who profit off it. And then when customers say, I've got a problem, you say, I'm only going to reimburse a narrow slice of those who hold up their hands and say that they have been defrauded on the system. But we could fix that problem right now in this committee. If you would all be willing to say, or any of you would be willing to say, if a customer is defrauded on Zelle and they come and complain to the bank, then the bank will make it good. Let's do this one by a show of hands. Who is willing to make that commitment to your customers? Senator, we are working. The owners of EWS are actually working. We are a closed network owned by banks, so you're exactly correct. 
that we have an ability to make a difference here and we are working on an answer to your question. We're, we're in the throes of figuring it out. Now, let me, let me continue, please. Zelle is one of the P P2P networks that you highlight. The others have 15 times the number of disputes coming into our company that we have no ability Mr. Tim Chad, insight Mr. 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 Warren, time, time, time has expired. Let me just finish here, if I can, finish. please. I just want to say on this, you tell me you are so much better than the others, and yet you've had two and a half months to bring the data forward, and you have not produced any numbers on this. I'm sorry, your credibility right now is riding at we, we zero. Were. Senator you Rounds. created Senator the Rounds. perfect weapon for criminals to use, and they have used it, and you have not stood behind your customers. Look, you are inviting Senator, this Senator Warren, your time, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Rounds is recognized. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit on the responses or the discussion that has just attempted to be completed. And I'd like to give each of you the opportunity here to perhaps clarify the situation. I think we're talking about uh, about Regulation E, which has to do with whether or not you have a fraudulent activity in which currently under Regulation E there are certain types in which your banks clearly would have a liability exposure. But the CFPB has suggested, and I think what Senator Warren was getting at, was to promote uh, the, the need for a CFPB or some other government organization to get actively involved in demanding that you pick up additional liability exposures on what we call rather than a person to person, but rather a me to me transaction where someone is defrauded by a criminal who is out to get their money and they voluntarily decide that they're gonna transact or, or move money from one location to another. Now, based on that, if, if my assumption is correct, could I just quickly move down the line? Uh, and I'll just start with Mr. Mr. Scharf. Is, is it your responsibility to make the decision or to, or to reimburse an individual who voluntarily, even though it's under a scam, is it your responsibility to repay or to get in the middle of that transaction and make someone whole again? Senator, I think what I, what, the way I'll answer the question is, I think what um, one of my colleagues was trying to say is, which is there is a tremendous amount that we can do as owners of the network to drive down the ability for thieves to take advantage of the network. Uh, that is what we're working on. That's what we have to do. Um, and at the same time we do that, the education that we do with our customers so that they don't put themselves in harm's way. And those two things should lead to the elimination of almost all of this fraud that exists. Thank you. Mr. Hornahan. Uh, thank you, Senator, for clarifying that. On unauthorized transactions, you heard earlier that all of us reimburse. Um, and then the rate of fraud claims, the broad claims, is in the low single digits basis points, which is lower than, same as for check. But when a person authorizes a transaction to a third party. When, when you say that, a lot of folks have to say, what are they talking about, low basis points? You're talking about very small percent of not, less than one percent. 99.98, I think, would be the right math. 99.98 of clean not, there's no claim. There's no claims. Okay. okay, give you a sense. Now, the other thing that you talked about is unauthorized, we, we take care of. If a person sends the money to someone under the volition after we, I think last quarter or month, we sent out 800 million notices, do you know this person that you're sending to L2 to try to stop what my colleague Mr. Scharf talked about? And they're, no, we're all doing the same thing. And then this person still sends the money to the person who promises to send them some. That's a difficult case, but we are working to make sure the receiver of that is disciplined and kept out of the system. And for that, we've had multiple institutions who won't police their customer base, not able to continue in Zelle. That's what we're working on. But if somebody says, I never authorize this, we take care of it. Thank you. Mr. Diamond? Totally the same answer. We would love to solve this problem. Uh, I'm sympathetic. No one wants these criminals and crooks, so we'd like to get into jail. Keep in mind, if you simply said that if you authorize a transaction, no matter what, you'll be repaid if you claim it's a scam, think of the problem of that. And that's why you can't go all the way the other way either. Thank you. Ms. Frazier? 
Thank you very much for the, for the question. I think what you're hearing from all of us is that we take fraud very, very seriously. We don't want our customers to be defrauded. Uh, we will repay when there is an unauthorized transaction. And we put a lot of investment, all of us, into the tools and the capabilities to try and stop and prevent the fraud, um, frauds happening in the first place and to protect our customers. And it's a responsibility we all take very seriously. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Senator, thank you for your focus on this important issue. And similar to the others on this panel, we, we do reimburse uh, according to Reg E. We reimburse way beyond that and focusing on our clients and trying to take care of you know, the challenges they're facing. But as I said in my testimony, we also all need to focus on working together, partnership, law enforcement, regulatory agencies to, to actually catch the criminals who are perpetuating this fraud against our consumers. Thank you. Ms. Cicero? I agree with everything that's said, and I think I would also say we're all working together to inform, educate, and help our customers in situations that may be fraud to help them understand those situations. Thank you. Mr. Dimichek. Thank you, Senator. I'm sorry the other senator left the room and didn't hear the answers. Um, we're focused on Zell. Zell is this big in terms of the fraud, and we need to fix it. The banks own it. These unregulated networks are this big, and that's where you need to help. We can't do anything about that. We'll fix Zell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. Yeah. Not wrong about that, Mr. Demchuk. Uh, Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. I want to pick up a little bit on some of Senator Warner's question uh, with respect to CDFIs and MDIs. And as all of you know, the Congress on a bipartisan basis made a major commitment uh, to these institutions back in December 2000 as part of the omnibus there, in fact, uh, yesterday the Treasury Department just announced $86 million uh, coming to Maryland institutions, uh, CDFIs and, and MDIs. Uh, and I want to focus on some of the, the, the banks represented here who have the biggest footprint in the state of Maryland. And I am familiar from our conversations, uh, Mr. Moynihan, Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Sharp, with what your banks are doing with respect to CDFIs and, and MDIs. Uh, I would just I'd like to ask each of you for your continued commitment uh, to these efforts in, in the state of Maryland uh, and beyond, but in the state of Maryland, because I do think they play a vital role in economic empowerment. If I could just ask each of you to, to commit to continue to work with us in Maryland. Uh, absolutely, Senator. You have our commitment, Senator. Senator, thank you for your leadership on this, and we absolutely commit to continue to support. Thank you. And I know cities also made some uh, investments in CDFIs in Prince George's County, and others have too. Uh, Mr. Demchak, on, on PNC, uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about this. Could you talk a little bit briefly about your, what you're doing in Maryland with respect to CDFIs? And, um, and in Maryland and across the country in markets, we've been contributing capital, uh, expertise, opening up ATM networks to MDIs, um, technology ex expertise, and we've been sending... Um, perhaps the most important thing as part of our community benefits plan is we've been sending dedicated mortgage officers into the CDFIs to help support uh, low-income housing. Thank you. No, I, I understand the broad efforts. I, uh, I was looking at some of the banks that have a footprint, bigger footprint in Maryland than, than some of the others. So We, we you, do as well, and we're there, and we put money into the CDFIs, and I we appreciate support them. If yep. you could just give me some information, not now, I, yep. on what you're doing in Maryland. Okay. Will do. Thank you. Um, let me get to the issue of overdraft fees. And uh, this seems to be an area where I know City announced uh, in June uh, that they're going to end their overdraft fees. Am I right about that? Uh, yes, we have eliminated our overdraft fees and NSFs. And but you still do provide customers with some flexibility with respect to their payments? Yes, we do. We, we provide a, a number of the ability to overdraft and uh, we give them plenty of warning if they're going to be doing so and, and the tools to manage their financial health and well-being. Got it. So let me, i just like to ask, I've been trying to review the policies with respect to overdrafts. I know everybody's been trying to make efforts here. Um, I, I did notice uh, uh, that uh, Wells Fargo generated $1.4 billion um, in overdraft revenue in 2021. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, $1.2 billion. If I could just ask each of, of you um, whether you have plans to try to phase out revenue from overdraft fees or whether this is an important part of your business model as you see it. Mr. Diamond. 
You know, those fees are coming down dramatically because the changes are already implemented. Like you got to go negative 50 before it gets charged. You have 24-hour recovery and grace period, advanced deposits and paychecks, et cetera. We think it's a service that clients want. So many people opt in. 70% of the time, they don't pay a fee at all. We do an overdraft. We just simply don't charge a fee because within that, that parameters I was telling you about. And I also reminding people that if you don't overdraft, they can pay an awful lot on the other side, in including municipal bills, tax bills. No, I, bill. okay. I, I, it's, it's not I, that simple. I, I, I'm just, fully aware of that, okay. Mr. Diamond. I, I just, I, I did notice, and we can get into some differences later, that the city, and you know, just happens to be the case in this instance, um, was able to provide that kind of flexibility, uh, apparently, while eliminating revenue going forward from, um, from overdrafts. And, and look, I think everybody knows uh, that we're talking about lower income people, paycheck to paycheck. We're talking about billions of dollars in losses. I mean, this is an example of why it's uh, expensive to be poor in the United States. Um, Mr. Scharf, can you comment briefly on um, what you're thinking with respect to the future on overdraft payments? Yes, Senator. Um, so one of the things we should point out is we've made a series of changes, uh, the last of which was just implemented recently. So we would also expect to see our overdraft uh, fees decline. Um, we have an account that has no overdraft fees in it, um, and so we give our customers the choice, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that those that do overdraft and pay the fees in these other accounts understand that there are other options for them, yeah. um, and we're going to continue to look at the fee structures that we have and uh, ensure that we're competitive out in the marketplace. I, I appreciate it. Look, I think Part, part of the answer here is the, the FedNow's real-time payment and uh, system, which I've been a strong <laughs> proponent, pushing them to uh, really accelerate the deployment. Um, I've also introduced today um, with colleagues from the House uh, and the Senate uh, the Payment Modernization uh, Act, which would essentially require um, institutions to make deposits available uh, as soon as they're deposited because people need a paycheck to paycheck Nobody should be making money off of them, uh, in my view, so long as they have the they have the ongoing revenue. It's just that their check is deposited one day. They can't access it. That makes no sense. As you know, many other countries uh, have already gone to real-time payment systems. So we're going to be pushing that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Van Hall. Senator Tillerson, North Carolina, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you all for being here. I. Uh, I, I want to echo what Senator Kramer said about the miraculous work you did for Paycheck Protection Program. I mean, that was back when I was advising banking clients. I'm not sure I would have put my foot on the accelerator as much as you all did, given that you were trying to figure out the rules of the road when the Treasury Secretary was giving you updates on facts. I mean, if people really understand the risk that you took ahead of the curb, everybody in Congress should be thankful that you did it because I think it saved the economy. As a matter of fact, we had several bipartisan bills. We were reacting to something none of us had ever seen. We hadn't seen a pandemic in 100 years. Um, and those bipartisan bills, I think, made, uh, made the difference between what I think could have been a, a fiscal disaster and helped us weather the storm. Um, but now I want to talk about what's happened over the last year and a half. Uh, we went from a series of bipartisan bills that we spent more than any one of us would have wanted to into a series of partisan bills that I think are at least in part one of the reasons why we have the problems that we do today. Two and a half trillion dollars on a purely partisan basis flooding the zone with more liquidity than we probably need it. Under President Biden, we're authorizing 80,000 more IRS agents we're going to retire student loan debt, which is going to be more stimulus into the system, $201 billion in additional regulatory costs, 131 million hours of net new paperwork. The president has signed 77 executive orders, the highest since President Ford, 40 times more than President Trump in the same time period, and three times more than President Obama. Um, last week, I had the occasion to go to Jacksonville, Florida. I always make time to drive 15 minutes away from it to visit the trailer park that I grew up at. At that time, it was about a plot of land, about 10 acres with six or seven trailers on it. Now it's got 100. And all but six are permanent residences. One of the reasons I do that, and I'll be going to the trailer park I grew up in in, in Nashville next month, 
One of the reasons I go through there is just to have a chance conversation with somebody there like me, a 19-year-old kid. I moved from Waikiki Boulevard, which it was called Hawaiian Village, where my parents lived, to Sugarcane Lane in the same trailer park, putting myself through community college. I like that chance opportunity to go to people and say, you can get out of where you are today, it's not where you can be. But I'm not really going, I didn't go to that trailer park on Friday, and I won't go to the one next month and have the same sort of optimism. In the, uh, in the hearing, uh, or not the hearing, but in Chair Powell's speech from Jackson Hole, he has clearly indicated to me that we are into tough sledding next year. The rates are going to get up to four to four to quarter percent. And I don't see how it, how it is possible. And in his words, he's talking about we're going to have to have a period of uh, below trend growth. To a lay person, what I'd tell that person in the trailer park is we're headed for a recession. And it's probably going to happen sometime second half of next year. Now, I know also Chair Powell said perception is reality, so let's not think that we're going into a recession because that could actually hasten it. I get that. But this is go time. This is when people need to start planning. And I think it's almost unavoidable that those people that grew up or are growing up in the same cir circumstances that I have are going to suffer from the policies coming from this body, not what you all are doing. And we have to recognize that and we have to prepare people for that. I do have one other question, or one question, and then I may have a few other comments. Uh, I actually believe that stakeholder feedback and engagement has been foundational to what you banks have done since you were founded. You invest in the community. I just spoke to the, the, the president of the North Carolina Bank for Bank of America. You've got a pilot in five cities now trying to go into some of the most distressed neighborhoods and encourage business and growth. Uh, you, you take stakeholders' uh, input into account. But I've just got one simple question, if you can raise your hands if you agree with this. At the end of the day, is it still shareholder primacy that ultimately drives your decision process? At the end of the day, the people who have invested in your banks, the people who have risk in it, uh, just show a hand. So at the end of the day, when you have to make a decision, you take the input from stakeholders, but then you make a decision. Thank you. Did I not see a show of hand over there? Okay. Thank you. So I, I think we need to get away from the, the woke and everything else. The only other question I have for you, are there any, uh, there are people talking about stakeholder capitalism is going to cause you all to make a strategic decision to unbank uh, the energy industry, particularly fossil fuels. Are any of you planning to get out of that business? Okay. So uh, I, I, for one, think that we need fewer regulations in this space. And just to something that Senator Kennedy made, and I'll finish here. Um, he said that you all need to speak up. But how on earth can you speak up if you're fulfilling your fiduciary responsibility to shareholders when you've got somebody out of control at the CFPB, the FDIC is a shambles, and the SEC? How can you possibly do that and fulfill your fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders because they will rain down hell on you? So I, for one, think that uh, Mr. Diamond, many others have alluded to it, if we want to avoid the bad story that I've got to tell those folks in the trailer park, I'll go visit next month in Nashville, we better get our act together, stop spending, stop taxing, right size regulations, because we can do more to avoid a fiscal crisis next year, a recession next year, than anything you all could possibly do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Tillis. Senator Smith of, of Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member, and thank you to all of you for being with us today. Earlier this year, the Minneapolis Fed published a paper examining the role that race plays in mortgage denials. Uh, you may know that the Minneapolis metropolitan area has the largest black-white home ownership gap in the entire country. And so while the Minneapolis Fed's findings weren't surprising, the pervasiveness of this issue is really dramatic. In the Twin Cities, people of color are up to three times more likely to be denied a conventional 30-year mortgage than white applicants. And we understand there are lots of issues at play, of course, but this study specifically focused on low uh, low-risk borrowers, and even when controlling for differences in income and credit scores and even where a home is located, black and Latino and Asian borrowers continue to be denied at high rates. So I want to um, ask uh, Mr. Scharf and Mr. Diamond first. Uh, you, your two banks um, are the two largest mortgage loan originators last year. Could you tell us briefly what 
steps you are taking to address this issue and how policymakers can assist um, and support the efforts that need to be taken here. Yes, Senator, um, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, I think we're all deeply committed to increasing uh, the amount of lending that we do to uh, the minority community. Um, I, I can speak to, at our company, we believe that our underwriting practices um, uh, are applied equally regardless of race. Uh, but there are a series of things that make it more complex and harder uh, for certainly ethnic minorities um, to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, an approval on a loan. Um, we have been working with the uh, government agencies on special purpose lending facilities uh, to be able to target those most in need. Um, uh, and we found the agencies to be uh, very willing and able to do that. Um, we know that things like FICO score um, are uh, something which uh, we all rely on and certainly is part of uh, the GSE, one of the things in the GSE underwriting criteria, and it doesn't appropriately account for things such as rent, uh, some utilities, phone bills, and right. things like that. Right. Um, and certainly for those that aren't homeowners, those payments are extremely important. Uh, so the more that we can do uh, to work uh, to uh, bring those things into um, credit scoring, I think, would be extremely useful. Mr. Diamond, would you like to add, please? I mean, we also are using special credit facilities, like looking at rent, utilities, et cetera. We have community branches. We opened a branch not far from where George Floyd was murdered. We're putting more loan offices in there. I agree there are problems with appraisals. Uh, there are problems with how you look at income, and we're trying to work on all of that. That's what we're doing. I also think the government can do some things to reduce the cost of origination, servicing, securitization, and would make smaller mortgages. So think of a mortgage of 100,000 to 300,000, much more affordable. And that obviously would help lower income individuals. So there's a lot that could be done to improve upon this. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cesare, U.S. Bank um, is headquartered in Minnesota. I believe your address is Nicolette Avenue, not Wall Street. Um, and I know from our conversations that you and U.S. Bank have wrestled with this, um, particularly in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, which happened in both of our hometowns. Um, it's impossible to look away from the systemic racism um, that we see in our community and in, in all communities, I believe. So could you discuss how, how you and U.S. Bank is approaching this issue and addressing this disparity in our hometown? Certainly. I think one of the uh, things we all realize is how complicated and complex the mortgage process can be. And one of the areas we're focused on, like one of my colleagues said, is putting loan officers in those low and moderate income communities that look just like the person applying for the mortgage and helping them through that complex process. That, and coupled with some of the other things we talked about with rate payments and utilities as being part of the underwriting process, I think all these things help the origination process be smoother, easier, and more successful for those individuals. And are you at U.S. Bank looking at ways to sort of track your progress on this? We are. In fact, uh, after that study came out, we, I personally met with the Fed leadership to talk about the uh, uh, data that they provided, some ideas we had, and we actually have a joint team working on it. Thank you very much. I want to also just associate with uh, myself with the comments from Senator uh, Warner and um, Senator Van Hollen about the power of CDFIs to help expand access to capital in communities, and I appreciate the comments of um, many of you on that topic. I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Smith. Um, Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'd like to turn to a topic that is disturbs me greatly. That's the trends in so-called ESG. I'm going to ask a series of simple questions and would appreciate a yes or no answer from each of you. Thanks. Mr. Rogers, by and large, when someone buys shares of your company, they get to vote on company directors and management in proportion to their ownership share in their class of stock. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Thank you. Mr. Moynihan, when hardworking Americans plan ahead by investing in a retirement fund, for example, a BlackRock or a Vanguard fund that tracks the S&P 500, they're effectively buying a small share of each company in the index, including your companies. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Cesari, when retirement investors buy shares in your companies through a fund managed by one of the major index fund providers, most of these votes are not cast by the shareholders. Instead, companies like BlackRock, or so-called proxy advisor, effectively make the voting determination for them, correct? That is correct. And how does BlackRock or Vanguard decide how to vote the average American shares? They have what's called an investment stewardship team that makes those decisions for them. 
This is at the heart of a troubling trend in the financial markets of weaponizing unsuspecting Americans' voting rights in the name of the radical environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, agenda. What these activists have figured out is that any radical policy that they can't get enacted through government can be advanced through corporate America by hijacking the trillions of dollars in voting rights from everyday Americans' retirement accounts. So a retired school teacher in Tennessee, like my mom, without her knowledge, is having the control that she paid for in her retirement accounts being wielded to push woke policies on corporations that she and a vast majority of Americans would find quite disturbing. Just last week, I spoke with the CEO of a publicly traded company who was given marching orders by a young man from the shareholder stewardship department of a large index fund provider. This young man was two years removed from college. In fact, the young man advised the CEO to divest his core business in the name of ESG. Why did this kid feel emboldened to do so? Well, because as an asset manager, he controlled a significant portion of his company's shares, voting rights that were essentially robbed from American shareholders. And this year's proxy season was particularly egregious. Most of your banks had to fight off activist proposals, including so-called racial equity audits and the forced debanking of oil and gas companies. So Mr. Diamond, I'd like to turn to you. Do you believe that these activist shareholder stewards are accurately representing the views of the individual investors who actually own these shares? Yeah, so all of those uh, uh, investors have a fiduciary responsibility to do their homework and vote. I personally think it's a disgrace when they rely on proxy advisors, and I think the proxy advisors are terrible. And I'm probably one of the few people who says that. I think it's a little bit worse than what you're saying because we've gone from 7,000 public companies to 4,000 operating companies over the last 20 years or so, and that's a problem. We're driving them private. This is part of the reason. And one, one thing I want to add, they're starting to do this pass-through proxy voting so that your mother can vote her shares. I'm kind of in favor of that. But the way shares get voted today, if the person doesn't vote, it counts as a yes vote on all, on all those proxies you're talking about. You got to change that, and get, you know it's got to be a quorum of all those who vote. Senator Sullivan is working on legislation to address this right now, and I support that legislation. Mr. Diamond, can I stay with you for just a moment longer? As an industry that's trying to refute claims from both sides of the aisle of being partisan, do you think that this trend in so-called shareholder activism actually complicates your ability to serve your clients? or to yield value for your shareholders more broadly? Yeah, well, I'm gonna do the right thing regardless of all that, but it is, it is causing a lot of consternation in uh, corporate America. Got it. I'd like to take a minute to go to a topic that Senator Toomey has already touched on, that's bank capital. Capital requirements are designed to be countercyclical, meaning banks build up capital during good economic times so that they can absorb losses and still deploy capital during economic downturns. That allows them to lend, lend to consumers and small businesses when access to credit is most needed. Fed Vice Chair Michael Barr all but indicated during a recent speech at the Brookings Institution that he intends to increase capital requirements for a large number of U.S. financial institutions, even as our economy has suffered two consecutive quarters of negative growth. That's the technical definition of a recession. So as our economy is in the midst of a serious weakening, do any of you believe that increases in capital requirements now won't have a negative impact on economic growth or on your ability to lend to growing businesses? I didn't think so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the panel members for being here. Let, let me talk about an issue uh, that is important in my state to help lower costs, which is affordable housing. Um, and uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, both uh, Mr. Scharf and Ms. Frazier. We've had this conversation. Um, and I know um, I just recently toured Decatur Commons. It's a $110 million affordable housing rental development in Las Vegas. It's a beautiful multifamily apartment development. It has 480 new units, uh, 240 units for low-income families and 240 units for low-income seniors. City and Wells Fargo helped provide the financing to build this with Nevada Hand uh, in Nevada. Uh, Mr. Scharf, in the past two years, Wells Fargo provided $128 million to finance six affordable rental housing projects, providing nearly 1,000 new affordable units in Nevada. Um, for those six developments, and in affordable housing just in general, your bank cannot just finance the entire cost uh, of a large development. Isn't that correct? In, in other words, you look to other uh, complex financing that may come from 
low-income housing tax credits, the housing trust funds, vouchers, and other funds to make the deal pencil out. Is that right? Uh, that is generally correct, yes. And Ms. Fraser, uh, in your testimony, you shared that city has also provided $5.6 million in 32 states to build affordable housing. Can you also share how federal funds work with the housing developments um, city finances? Um, I think similar to how you described it, it's uh, the, the low tax uh, credits are an absolutely critical component to be able to bring together the different elements of a financing for the affordable housing projects. And we would certainly be encouraging the expansion um, of those credits so we can bring more and more capital into this critical need. Thank you, because I do think it is important. Uh, I, I've uh, listened to my colleagues, we all agree um, there, we've got to lower costs around affordable housing. There is a role for Congress to play here. There's legislation that is out there that I uh, support, and some of my colleagues do, that we should be passing to address this, to bring back the opportunity for families, first-time home buyers, for seniors, for uh, low-income families, and so many to be able to afford uh, housing in this country. So I thank you for that. Let me give an opportunity to the other panelists. I'm curious with your banks, the work that you're doing around affordable housing as well. And I don't know, um, Mr. Moynihan, if you want to start. Um, a couple of things, Senator. One, uh, we compete for those projects. And so we are one of the larger, we're all among the largest people who invest in long, uh, long income house and tax credit driven transactions. And I think we have 2,700 properties around the country we invest in. One of the things I'd um, raise with you to think about is in the Federal Advisory Committee, you'll see some reference, and we were asked by the Fed what could you do. So I think things like permitting, I think making sure these tax credits aren't lost if uh, the OECD 15% tax rate is approved, because in the end of the day, it drives the activity, and that's that's at risk if that gets approved, and that's up to you. I think um, the other thing is to continue to be inventive, a, a little bit like you did with the MDIs and CDFIs, with equity to developers to enhance the equity part, because that we can only lend when there's something underneath us, and you need both the expertise to develop and also the equity, but it's a critical critical issue, and we all work on it every day. I mean, we've got literally $5 billion we did last year. We'll do another 5 or $6 billion this year. It's not something we're unfamiliar with, and I think I'd encourage you to sit with our experts, and they can give you 8,000 things that could make it easier. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for your leadership on this, Senator. We have about $4 billion invested in affordable <laughs> projects at about a billion last year, about 19,000 individual units. The only thing I could add to the discussion, I think opportunities to fast track those projects in certain communities, as we talk to our builders, uh, they're often having time getting the approvals to get started. And I think if we could get the affordable housing to the front of the line in communities, it would be really helpful. Okay. We have similar numbers, Senator, and I would also say, as you mentioned, the banks not only play a role in the low-income housing tax credit, but collecting capital from all sources and making sure that the project is, is successful in its objective, and I think that's a key component of our focus as well. Okay. Thank you. We're obviously large in the business as well. I would just point out that I, this is one of the most successful um, private public partnerships that I think we could point to in terms of having the intended outcome. And we should expand it and we should do more things like it. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so very much, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Daines. Senator Warnock, thank you. As we sit here today, inflation is up 8.3% from a year ago. It's barely below 40-year highs that were reached earlier this year. Food prices, shelter, new cars, medical services all increased by nearly a percentage point from last month. It's not surprising that we're seeing this level of inflation. Uh, those of us on this side of the aisle uh, were warning the administration back in March of 2021 about pushing forward here with these massive stimulus bills when there was a trillion dollars of unspent COVID funds sitting out there in December of 2020. Unfortunately, that was just the start of the spending for this administration. In fact, an analysis from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget Estimates, they estimate the Biden administration has approved $4.8 trillion in new borrowing through 2031 in the form of executive actions and enacted legislation. The student debt cancellation announced last month could cost as much as a trillion dollars if you ask the folks over at Penn Wharton. It's amazing to me that the Biden administration can say with a straight face that we're working to get inflation under control. 
Well, they have approved $4.8 trillion in additional borrowing. The so-called Inflation Reduction Act would, will reduce deficits by only $238 billion, leaving about $4.6 trillion in inflation creation. And of course, this inflation comes with real consequences for Montanans and all American workers. We're seeing the decreases now in real wages of about 2.8% over the past year. I want to start, uh, Mr. Diamond. President Biden recently said during a 60 Minutes interview that inflation, quote, needs to be put in perspective, and that the monthly inflation rate had, and I quote, hardly risen. My question is, do you agree with that assessment and with the president's implication that we are overreacting to the inflation that we're seeing in this economy? I'm not going to comment on what the president said, but uh, it is high. It's likely to come down a little bit because some of those things are going to go away, but pieces are more, more embedded, like wages, housing, which are not going to go that quickly. And a lot of that stimulus is not spent yet. So, so rising rates may have to go higher than what people expect. And of course, if you have a global recession for whatever reason, it'll help ameliorate that, but that's the bad reason. The most important thing is to avoid stagflation. Stagflation is the most damaging to every part of society, every industry, all income levels. Uh, and th therefore, I think it's important to get our hands around inflation as quickly as possible. Mr. Scharf, uh, what, what are your thoughts there on the, on the inflation battle? I would, I would uh, agree with Mr. Diamond. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, I want to shift gears for a moment and talk about board composition. I'm very concerned as we look across corporate America. You know, I spent a good part of my private sector career uh, working for a, a Fortune 50 company uh, to ensure that we have boards that have... Uh, I'll just call it balanced ideological tension, for lack of a better phrase. We've seen what's happened with journalism has gone left, entertainment has gone left. I don't want to see corporate America uh, tip the teeter-totter, frankly, one way or the other, as they work every day to take care of their shareholders. Mr. Moynihan, I know as we think about diversity, I know you believe that's important, of course. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, ideological diversity. I, I think, I mean, I heard somebody describe diversity at Harvard is where everybody looks really different but thinks exactly the same. Um, the question is, I've looked at the Bank of America's board. It contains twice as many Democrat donors as Republican donors. And I'm not asking that you, add, that you tip the teeter tot to the right, but how, how do you maintain ideological diversity as it relates to board composition? I, I honestly, I don't know what our board does for political contributions. It's not part of what we look at. Uh, our company gives to uh, candidates of both sides of the aisle. Um, it, not our company, but the, our PAC does, which is independent of me. I didn't make decisions. But mm -hmm. I think if you look at our board members, the thing you find in consistency is executives have been very senior roles like you in, a, in big companies because of complexity. So former CEOs. Uh, former bankers, and it's a great board, and they do a great job. But that that experience base of, of making decisions in a big, complex company is what we look for, and that has. I've never asked a director how they vote. Honestly, I've asked them. Do, I've asked them about their experiences and what they could do to help our company be better. Um, Ms. Fraser, question on um, on energy. Uh, we're seeing, of course, energy prices going up dramatically. Europe is a case study of what not to do at the moment. It's going to be a really tough winter over in Europe because of very poor choices made, starting with the Germans and others in terms of taking out base low power. Um, you stated back in April of 20 they would not finance Arctic drilling in Alaska. However, uh, City has had no problems doing business with Russian oil companies and was the last to announce a pullout from Russia. Um, in fact, Citigroup did not even stop soliciting clients in Russia for three weeks after the February 24th invasion. Um, my question is, why would we be using market share to put pressure on a shut down American energy when the world's energy supply for, uh, uh, is, is, is in great need of more made in America energy? And, and of course, energy demand is going to increase 50% in the next 25 years for the world. Uh, so we need more energy, not less. And coal, Just oil, natural gas to be part of it. I want yeah. to note that the gentleman's 50 seconds right. over I'll, already. All right. I'll let, her, I'll let her respond. Um, then th thank you for the question. Very briefly, I think there is a very important balance to be, to be attained over the next 
few decades of the balance between energy security and energy supply, as well as a transition to cleaner, um, cleaner energy sources. Um, and that's going to be an important balance. We will, play a, we will play an important role in both. Yeah, the Europeans lost sight of balance. Let the record state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daines. Uh, I'll, I'll now acknowledge myself for a question. Uh, when it comes to the cost for families, the country's biggest banks often set the pace for the rest of the country. This is why it's so important for us to hold the biggest banks accountable for the services they provide. Smaller banks imitate policies that you set for your banks throughout the nation. This is especially true for the fees you charge your customers. And in a recent report, the CFPB detailed the crippling effects of overdraft fees and the impact that this is continuing to have on families. These penalties fall on a small number of folks uh, who carry most of the fees with banks charging 80% of fees to only 9% of account holders, 80% of fees to 9% of account holders. Typically, these lower income folks are already struggling financially. These fees make conditions worse and can keep them trapped in a cycle of debt. I do want to recognize that some of the banks present, such as Citi and Bank of America, have eliminated or taken strides to reduce their fees. Mr. Rogers, earlier this year, Truist announced a new account type with no overdraft fees. Uh, how do these accounts affect customers' overall financial health? What are you seeing, especially for those who frequently overdraft or lower-income folks? Thanks, Senator. Uh, specifically as to Truist One, uh, this is an account with no overdraft fees, but uh, the other feature that I think is almost more important is it has a negative $100 buffer. So in addition to not charging a fee, we did a lot of study and a lot of work about how much clients typically overdraw in terms of an amount. Uh, so this $100 negative buffer is, is afforded to every client uh, and allows them to continue to transact. So not only not have fees, but able to pay the dairy care, take care bill, pay the rental bill, uh, and the activity that we've seen in that's really important. And then I think also we have another account called the Truist Confidence Account. And I think in that case we've seen, and we've tried to do some studies around this to learn more, We've actually seen new entrants into the banking system. So someone who was previously unbanked, who may have not come to Truist for some of our other account capabilities, came into our system with these type of accounts. So I think in addition to providing the buffers, I think we're affording more entrants into the banking system, which, which I believe has got to be a goal for us. Yeah. Well, thank you. And some of the banks that are testifying today still uh, have restrictive policies in place that make it difficult for hardworking uh, families to meet their basic needs. So I'd like to eat, ask each of you, and will you commit today to work to eliminate onerous fees? A simple yes or no would suffice, and you can elaborate in writing after the hearing. I'll begin with Mr. Scharf. Will you work to eliminate onerous fees? Senator, we have an account that does simple not yes. have fees. Well, we have an account that does not have fees, which has, so the customer has the option and we're gonna to continue to look at our fee structures. Mr. Diamond? I would say the same thing, and we've already made a lot of changes since that report, which I'd love to share with you, and we have the same type of ways to make it easy for people. I do think giving people a choice and letting them opt in or out is a, is a proper thing to do, and it actually saves them from far worse pain and suffering, that you don't bounce a check or something, and a lot of people, that get charged much more on the other side. So when we looked at this, we said it is more respectful. I agree with the fact it gets misused sometimes. We've got to do a better job on counseling, closing, et cetera, for those where it's just too much. So you're committed to doing a better job? Yes. Mr. Cessary? Senator, we also have an account that provides no overdraft fees. I think an important component of this as well, though, is, is education and alerts to the customers when they're entering a situation that they may overdraft and help them in advance with other alternatives, and that's something we're also focused on. Mr. Demchek. Senator, we led the charge to drop overdraft fees. We have two accounts with no fees. We have a unique product that actually allows the client to choose in the moment if they want to return the item or pay the item. Um, and we'll continue to look uh, on how to improve that. Okay. I've seen personally as a senator, as pastor, the impact that these fees have on ordinary folks who are just struggling. 
uh, trying to trying to make ends meet. Uh, so this is an important issue, one that I'll stay on. Now I'm I'm concerned uh, that um, uh, with part of what's happening in this in this moment, uh, according to the FDIC quarterly banking profile, the banking sector's profits declined. 8.5% year over year in the second quarter of 2022. And here's my concern is, is that as you um, are dealing with that larger economic reality, I imagine that you've discussed ways to find new revenue streams or to cut costs. Mr. Monahan, has Bank of America discussed opening up other revenue streams or reintroducing financial products to offset these losses? Uh, no, sir. Have you considered uh, looking back at the changes your bank has made to reduce fees over the past year? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Mr. Frazier, same question. Ms. Frazier, I'm sorry. Uh, we're we perpetually looking at what we can do to make our fees more customer friendly um, and what we can do to uh, make sure we provide access to those who um, don't have ready access to banking services. So it's a perpetual move that we make. So you're, you're committed to not uh, balancing your, your budget on the banks of the most marginalized customers? Yeah, we, we absolutely were committed to that. Thank you so very much. Mr. Chair. The distinguished senator from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I remember when you were all the way down here with me. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, happened. Okay, thank you all for being here. I'm going to try to get through a lot as efficiently as possible. I want to begin, uh, Mr. Scharf, by talking about housing supply and affordable housing. I recently wrote to you and several other mortgage lenders about accessory dwelling units, so uh, basement or backyard apartments, in-law suites. There's some regulatory changes at the FH. FA related agencies that may allow more lending to capitalize the construction of accessory dwelling units. Just like your uh, commitment that you're going to respond to my letter thoughtfully and consider how you can capitalize more of that construction to bring more housing supply online and help more families afford housing. Absolutely, Senator, we will. Thank you, Mr. Scharf. Uh, Ms. Fraser, I'd like to ask you about language access to banking services for prospective homeowners, for entrepreneurs accessing uh, credit, accessing depository services in languages other than English is important for many of my constituents. I noted that uh, Citigroup now offers the City Mobile app entirely in Spanish. Uh, that's a step that I applaud. Just uh, in, in brief, can you talk about other opportunities to expand access to banking services for Spanish speakers, Korean speakers, other non-English language speakers? Well, first of all, I agree with you. The importance of making this very accessible, um, having it in a language one understands is an important element of providing access to banking services. Uh, the other efforts are also on um, the digital technologies that have evolved is making sure that those are readily available for those that uh, those populations that haven't been used to uh, working with a bank and maybe intimidated walking into a bank branch or asking for assistance is also an important um, step forward. So I think those the, both the, the app um, and also working with our different partners uh, in various communities, um, making sure that we're providing webinars uh, or other areas. So it's a, it's a friendliness um, towards the bank to build trust and understanding and, and comfort with we using the many services we have available. Thank you, Ms. Fraser. And let's let's remain in touch about how the industry can can better serve uh, linguistically diverse communities. Uh, Mr. Moynihan, I'd like to uh, ask you a question about uh, the vulnerability of various communities to fraud. There's been some discussion of, of Zelle here. I'm particularly worried about scams and fraud that we've seen in Georgia targeting veterans, targeting new mothers. I'd like for you to just commit to uh, following up with my office. Your staff can follow up with my office about the steps that you're taking and that you recommend based upon what you've seen is effective to protect veterans and new mothers and families in Georgia and across the country from fraud. Will you do that, please? Uh, sure, Senator. I think if you, you may have missed it earlier, but we had a fairly robust discussion about all the commitments by all my colleagues and ourselves to continue to work on the fraud side of this. I didn't miss it. I followed it closely, but I'd just like to hear from your team on how we can work together sure. to continue to crack down on fraud. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Scharf, question for you about uh, uh, rural bank closures. Uh, many rural counties in Georgia, Hancock County, Wheeler County, Dooley County, have lost branches. 
what steps can banks take, and I've just got a minute and a half left, some more ground to cover, but in a nutshell, to sustain the availability of credit and banking services in rural communities? Well, first of all, I think banks should be very, very sensitive. I think we are about not leaving a community unbanked. And so if we uh, are looking at closing facilities, um, we should think twice about it if there's no other banking service there. And uh, that could mean us staying or working with a community bank or selling those deposits and customers to someone else there. Uh, that in addition to um, some innovative solutions that we're all working through, such as uh, mobile banking, um, and I mean physical mobile banking, which comes to different communities at different points in uh, the week, uh, is also an interesting solution. Mr. Scharf, uh, follow up for you. Obviously, as lenders, you have obligations, fiduciary obligations, shareholder obligations, regulatory obligations to assess the creditworthiness of borrowers, uh, and that's part of your job. Um, how can creditworthiness be accurately assessed without using methodologies with unintended consequences that might, for example, discriminate on race or other lines? Well, I think you know one of the things that we talked about earlier is the, uh, the need to continue to try and refine FICO scores. Um, which I think we're all doing work on. Uh, a lot of it's being led by the OCC, uh, but we all have our individual efforts as well uh, to look at things like rent payments, utilities, um, uh, phone bills and things like that, because those very often are the consistent payments that uh, uh, more diverse people uh, wind up uh, uh, building their credit upon and aren't always reflected in a FICO score. Thank you. With the chairman's indulgence, one final question. Uh, uh, sure. It's a compound question. You'll forgive me, I hope. Mr. Diamond, uh, this is a good one to close on. Dodd-Frank, what's working, what's not, and is financial regulation fragmented across too many agencies with overlapping jurisdiction? Let's see, maybe the chairman may but, give you a minute to answer that one. Mr. Diamond, yeah, Mr. Diamond, try to answer in 60 seconds. What, what, ha what worked is to resolution recovery, capital liquidity, that was all good. Most, a lot of things in there had nothing to do with all that. Lehman Brothers simply wouldn't happen today. Too much capital, too much billable debt, too much liquidity, et cetera. Regulations have to be calibrated. So the things that don't work is, you know, I mentioned yesterday, we're, we're going to have a trillion dollars of cash at one point, unable to deploy to help clients because you're going to run into these red lines of various capital things. And my, my request is pe people should just thoughtfully look at the, the effect of these things. And our regulatory system also made it very hard for our regulators. So if you, we talk about housing here. There are seven people with independent authority on mortgages. So it's almost impossible to change them in a way that would benefit America. And you know, I wish one day we would fix that problem. We balkanized the system. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. Uh, anyone that concludes the hearing, anyone listening today heard a lot from you about the strength of your industry, how well capitalized your banks are, how well you weather the pandemic, how well your, de how well your depositors did, how generously your banks have, have uh, changed your overdraft fee schedule. But let's be clear, you're well capitalized and you've thrived throughout the pandemic because of the capital requirements and safety and soundness measures you passed, that we passed in Dodd-Frank, which you lobbied against, I would add. Your depositors had more money in their accounts because we put money in their pockets with the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan, and the child tax credit. You reformed your overdraft practices after years of pressure from this committee. Most of what you boasted about today came about because, either because of laws this committee in the Senate passed or because of pressure we placed on your industry, often despite some of your very expensive and very often effective lobbying efforts. Like most big corporation, big banks have repeatedly shown you'll not do the right thing without strong laws, without accountability, without public pressure, without oversight. That's the job of this committee. I say that and I also say that as chair, I look for places of agreement, places we can work together. Today, not surprisingly, we found some. Um, I listened to you about regulating what we should do about regulating FinTech. I particularly appreciate uh, the chair of PNC and even when he did this especially and how that I think really reached people on this committee that were listening or watching uh, that, that we need to make sure that the growing part of the economy, the FinTechs, the, what we need to do with ILCs, uh, we can't count on them to do the right thing out of the goodness of their hearts and they need strong rules too. Uh, thank you again to the witnesses. Uh, for senators who wish to submit questions, those questions are due one week from today, Thursday, September 29th. To all of the seven of you, again, thanks for your cooperation. You have 45 days to respond to any of those questions. Thank you again. Senator Toomey, thank you. Committee's adjourned.